All right. Um, it is 2.33. I'm going to go ahead and start our introductions and welcome. So first, let me say welcome. I don't keep a count of the number. This I don't know if this is the 7th or the 17th, um, but we have this Applied Ecology Minors Research Symposium at the end of every semester. Um, and this semester we have, oh, we had 12 originally presenting and we've had a couple cancellations. So send your best vibes out into the universe. Um, but welcome, thank you, thank you for coming in person. Thank you for joining us online. Really delighted to have you all here and to showcase what students are doing for the Applied Ecology Minor. I also want to take a moment just to um, celebrate that we currently have 55 students enrolled in the minor. Um, we had another student enroll like just in the last couple of days. So always going up, always increasing. Um, and as of this May 2023, um, as opposed to all those other May 2023s you might have heard about, we will have graduated our 130th student with applied ecology minor. So awesome. Thanks. Thanks for being a part of this. Um, before we get started, I also want to acknowledge that this land was originally stewarded by the Skarura, Tuscarora, Catawba, and Lumbee tribes. Our goals in applied ecology are to study the natural non-human world around us and to apply what we learn to better manage or conserve natural resources. But it's important to remember that we humans are inherently part of nature. We are not separate from it. And that way before settler scientists decided this was important, expert knowledge and care for the natural world was already applied as an integral part of indigenous cultures around the world. We are privileged to be able to practice science and study ecology in academia, but I hope we remember always that the Western, the scientific, the academic way, are not, that's not the only way. And it's not likely even the best way. Acknowledgement is a form of decolonization, which is dismantling an existing power structure. In order to change systems of oppression, we need to first acknowledge that the system is built on oppression. North Carolina State University is a land grant university, which means it originally received funding through the Morrill Act, which was federal legislation that bought or forcibly stole land from indigenous tribes. The sale of indigenous lands raised $134,920 to fund NC State originally. That's the equivalent of $3,810,578 today. I hope that we can disrupt and dismantle colonialism beyond a simple territory acknowledgement by supporting and empowering each of you as scientists. With that, I'm really excited to learn from our speakers today. We do have a slight change to our program today. Um, one student chose to postpone and another student has had to reschedule. So um, without, and I wanna remind you before you get started that we have part two coming on Thursday um, from 11.30 in the morning until 1.05 p.m. But with that, I'm gonna transition to Katie French, who's gonna get us started. So please be patient with my poor little computer as it tries to take off. All right, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Katie French and today I'll be talking about the research I did um, and it's called Fungal Identification and Degradation of Siderophores. And if you don't know what siderophores are, don't worry, I will explain. You'll have to click one time and then everything else. There you okay, go. so first I want to talk about iron. Iron is necessary for lots of living things to function, but especially for plants. Um, there are many forms of iron and some are available to plants and some are not available to plants. So if we look at the plants on the left side of this graphic, you can see that there's iron in that soil, um, but it's not being taken up by the plant. You don't see the iron in its cells. So that's a, that's a sad plant that we're going to call that one. And on the right, we see a slightly different 
makeup of graphics. So we see the iron being taken up into the plant. We see it in the leaves and in the roots. And we also see these yellow graphics that I have made to represent sideropores. So the sideropores are actually what's helping the iron get from the soil to the plant, from an unavailable form to an available form. Sideropores are small organic molecules that are created by bacteria, fungi, and plants. And they're, they're made, they're produced in order to help that organism, the original organism, get iron. So today we'll just be focusing on the interaction between sideropores and fungi. Um, but I just wanted to introduce the concept of iron and sideropores. So the little yellow graphic that I made is in gray at the top of here, but this is what sideropores look like in their molecular structure. So these are three different examples. Um, I'm showing DFOB, protokylene, and PDMA. You don't need to memorize anything about these, um, but I'm just pointing to a couple of the chelating groups. And all that means is that there's an OH group there's several OH groups on each of the sideropores that is actually where it binds to the iron. So that's the actual like attachment point you could think of it like. Um, and that's just an example of three different kinds of sideropores. DFOB is a hydroximate, protokylene is a catecholate, and PDMA is a synthetic phytosiderophore. And the phyto part just means it comes from a plant. So getting to the research, um, our part one was to take three different fungi to see if they would produce sideropores. We know that some fungi produce sideropores and we just wanted to know, will these fungi produce sideropores? And we didn't actually know if they would produce anything. Um, and so we wanted to put them in a minimal media um, to make sure that like they were being challenged to create the sideropores. We wanted them in like a we didn't want to put them just in the soil. We wanted to see on a blank slate, how would they perform? So we took three different fungi. Our first fungi is Phanodontia chrysosporium. It's a white rot fungus. So if you see like a, for, a log of rotting in the forest, it uh, might be on that log. It decays wood and it has like a, a light color. Uh, that's it on a plate. And then we have Linomania elongata, which was um, isolated from populous roots. And then we have Pyronophora bisubtata, which is in quotes and has a question mark next to it because we're not exactly sure if um, that is the real identity of it. We have used morphological identification to get that far. We've also measured some of the spores, which won't be in this slide, but if you have questions about it, it was part of the research and I just didn't get to put it in this presentation, um, but you can ask me about it later. But these are all soil associated fungi. That's why we wanted to pair them with this study with sideropores. So we took these three fungi, I grew them on solid media and then I grew them in liquid media. Then I rinsed them off of that liquid media and I homogenized them, which just means I blended them up really finely. I separated them into an iron limited environment and an iron rich environment. And then we basically looked for any sideropores that they might've produced. And what we found was that on the left, which was the iron limited environment, this is a chrome azurol S assay. And it basically just works like, um, almost like a pregnancy test or a pH test. Uh, the blue solution will turn pink if it detects sideropores. So we see on the right hand of that, um, we see three blue wells and then a pink well, and that's where the Pyronophora bisubtata sample was. So it detected sideropores in its free form. Um, then on the right, we see some imagery where we see absorbance at around 475 nanometers. And all that means is that we likely are seeing an uh, iron sideropore complex in the iron rich environment. So we see that the iron and the sideropore have bonded and that's what we find in the analysis. So basically we found a sideropore that Pyronophora bisubtata produced. And when we checked the mass of that sideropore, it actually matched a known sideropore's mass. So we think that that's most likely the sideropore it produced. But the other two, um, fungi, Phanodontia chrysosporium and Linomania elongata, 
did not produce siderophores. So moving on to the next part of our research, we wanted to study how these three fungi and how the siderophores that I talked about in the beginning, how they would interact and, um, and how these fungi might degrade siderophores. So we wanted to check on like, it's important about the competition that might happen in the soil for iron. Are these fungi able to degrade and like attack other sideropores so that another plant or another organism that released those sideropores can't get it anymore? So they would be more competitive. So we looked at the ability to degrade sideropores and we looked at the same three fungi and we looked at these Sideropores, DFOB, protocoline, and PDMA, like I talked about in the beginning. So basically, we did the same methods. And instead of um, checking for siderophores after the first like round, after the iron limited and iron rich environment, um, we added siderophores. And then we waited after certain time points to see does it matter the amount of time that we add the siderophores to the fungus? that it will degrade more or less. So we added some and took samples at one hour. We took samples at 12 hours. We took samples at one day, at four days to see if the amount of time we left it for would impact the degradation. This is a busy slide, but I'm gonna break it down. <laughs> um, so we found that if you look at the columns, we have protokeline, DFOB, and PDMA. Those are the siderophores. On the left-hand side, we have the fungi. We use two different strains of our first fungi. So there's like four fungi that we really kind of tested. Um, but if you just focus on the first row, the top row in black, you're looking at the relative abundance of that siderophore. So when you're looking at the protokeline and PCRP78, you're looking at protokeline's peak in the sample of the first fungus, which was Phanerodontary Crisis Forum, which is PC. Then for DFOB, you see the same peak. And then for PDMA, you see the same peak. And that is basically representing that we didn't see any degradation in any of the of any of the siderophores in the first culture. You can see it's this about the same in blue right under that, but actually in the third, um, on the third row where Phanerod or Pyronophora bicetata was we see a missing peak for protokeline and a decreased peak for DFOB. And we actually have some really exciting information about the degradation of DFOB. If you wanna ask me about that, I have more slides. They just couldn't fit in this um, presentation. So please ask me about that. But basically we see that Pyronophora bisetata degraded protokeline and DFOB in the iron limited media, but it didn't, produce, it didn't degrade PDMA. None of our um, samples really degraded PDMA. And that was the synthetic siderophore. So that might make a little bit of sense. So in the iron rich media, we took away one of the strains. So there's there's fewer rows, um, but we see the same kind of results. Protokeline is degraded again in Pyronophora bisubtata, but DFOB is not in the iron rich media, which was kind of like a curveball. Uh, we didn't know what the iron was going to do, but it did in fact some sort of way protect the DFOB from being degraded. That's that's our preliminary thought. So in conclusion, Pyronophora bisubtata produced a siderophore in the mineral media after 96 hours. It also degraded protokeline in the iron limited media and DFOB in iron limited media. And Phanerodontoprisis borium and Linemania elongata did not produce siderophores, nor did they degrade any of the siderophores that we added. In the future, we're working on confirming the identity of Pyronophora bisubtata, which we did in conjunction with all of this other research. Um, we extracted the DNA of Pyronophora bisubtata, and it's working on getting done to like match the sequence. So we'll have a, an ID on that fungus soon. And like I said, we measured the spores. Um, but we would also like to repeat this study to make sure um, with negative controls to make sure that everything checks out. I would like to acknowledge all the scientists on the screen that helped me with like my first big research experience, uh, Dr. Mark Cubetta, Dr. Lindsay Becker, Dr. Oliver Bars, and Emmanuel and Juliet who showed up 
Thank you so much. And I'm ready for your questions. Oh. They just, they didn't produce sidereophores in the conditions that we had them in. First of all, like, like maybe they just weren't detectable on what we did. Um, and they might under stress, under more stress, they might produce sidereophores. Um, but they should be able to like still take in iron. Sidereophores are just like a, in an advantageous way of doing that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You they didn't they segregated the mm -hmm. so yes. Okay. So DFOB. We didn't see the same sort of results about protokeline. Um, but for the DFOB, we can actually see that you can see on the left, we see like another one of those relative abundance peaks. And the original mass of DFOB is five to five sixty-one. And what we saw were masses of if you take an oxygen atom away from DFOB, we saw that mass. And then if you take another oxygen away, we saw that mass. And then if you take another oxygen away, we saw that mass in lesser and lesser abundances. So we can maybe start to think that the oxygens on the chelating groups, which is where the iron binds to, are being plucked off. That's what we think is happening when they're being degraded because the mass follows a, a decrease in oxygen atoms. And that's important because that's where the iron binds to. So if this degradation is actually like breaking apart the siderophores, that's a really important for competitive um, advent, advent, advantages in the soil for plants and animals or plants in the soil, microbes. Um, so that looks like the potential degradation product of DFOB. And the, those are all the sides. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So in the way you're fascinating, um, not necessarily the same thing, so it's me out, but is there, um, I don't know, like bringing up an application for this that you would see in plots, or like how is there even in the country that we can learn to manipulate from the community for I definitely think there's there's room for like the use of siderophores in in plenty of cases where like iron needs to be taken up and like if if we find a fungus that produces the siderophore and that doesn't degrade it or that degrades it we might want to like that might be like a a pathogen or something so it would be important to know for those reasons um that's a great question it there's lots of applications yeah yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that they basically like surround it. So on one of these slides, I will find it with the one that it produced. Like it's they usually look like that, and the iron would be in the middle. Yeah. That's something we still don't really know. We think that it probably has like a, a limited ability to chelate the iron. Um, but since it might be breaking apart those oxygens, like that, that is what makes it a siderophore. So there's still more to be done to look at like the what happens to the actual um, siderophores after they've been degraded. <laughs> but good question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. For those of you on Zoom, the disclaimer is I cannot see the screen from where I have to um, adjust the talks. So we cannot see your chats in real time. But I will try to remember at the end of everyone's uh, each individual's talk, if we escape out of the talk, then you'll be able to see chats as they come up, okay? All right. 
Next up, we have Ren Rooney. Are you ready? Okay, we're shifted forward just a wee bit because we did have one cancellation last minute. And if you click on the slide first, it will advance and then you can use your focus. Okay, I think so. <laughs> or we'll just click, click once and go back. There you okay. go. Now you're ready. Awesome. Alrighty. So have you ever seen a bee in a field of flowers and thought, huh, I wonder which flowers she's actually collecting pollen from? So my research seeks to address that question. Uh, my name is Ren, and I'm going to be presenting on my project entitled Foraging Pattern, Foraging Preferences of Bee Communities in Pollinator Habitats. So as I'm sure you guys all know, pollinators, especially bees, are essential to our agricultural production and the health of our ecosystems as a you know, very broad overview. So there's been rapid declines in these really important species due to anthropogenic factors, um, with particular concern about the loss of nesting sites and foraging habitats. So recent attention on these issues has led to efforts to that support pollinator diversity and abundance uh, by planting pollinator-friendly habitats. And one example of a uh, actually government-led program is actually in North Carolina. So in 2015, there's an initiative entitled Protecting MC Pollinators that was implemented by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Um, and they uh, mandated planting pollinator habitat at all 18 of the NCSU research stations all across North Carolina. So they, these stations planted the Southeast wildflower seed mixes from American Meadows. And these contained a, multiple, a multitude of different flower species supposed to promote uh, pollinator visitation. And you can see, you can see here, there's an image of one of the pollinator habitats. You can see, you know, lots of beautiful different flowers. And um, so Dr. Hannah Levinson, along with April Sharp and um, with Dr. David Tarpey, went to these field stations to examine how this new habitat affected these bee communities. And um, in that rotating uh, figure there, you can see some of their findings. So, um, so each of these pie charts represents samples that were collected at each station, cycling through the three years that data was collected, 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, the relative size of the pie chart represents the abundance of the samples, and the colors show the um, bee communities that were found, and they found that the abundance and diversity generally increase at the habitats across the three years, and that while the communities across North Carolina stayed relatively the same, there was a lot of variation across the sites and years that they believed was due to the habitat characteristics playing a role in this presentation. So to further understand how the bee communities use this habitat, uh, Dr. Levinson and April Sharp collected bee samples from eight of the pollinator habitats in 2019, documenting the species that they were collected on and conducting a pollen grain analysis. Um, and in this figure, you can see kind of what some of the pollen grains look like. Something interesting to note is that all three of these are part of the same family, the aster family, and um, the pollen grains can look a lot of different ways. So um, their research suggested that bees are actively collecting pollen from different flowers, which has implications of diverse pollinator preference. Um, and a further interest is whether this, the, the preferences of these bees forging from different pollinator habitats have high floral fidelity and um, measuring this can have a uh, significant implications for their, um, their general preferences. And that is where the gap of the knowledge is analyzing these particular patterns and um, what can be planted to attract higher bee abundance and diversity. So my current project objectives include measuring which bee species are visiting which flower species, analyzing the differences among the bee species for the floral preference, characterizing the attractiveness of native versus non-native plants to the bees, and classifying how many different pollen types different bee species collect. And I hypothesize that the native plants will attract different types of pollinators than the non-native plants, and that different bee species will have different numbers of pollen types. Um, so, to analyze these, my the research is focusing on those species specimens that were collected from four of the different habitats in 2019. So roughly 3,500 total bee individuals were observed across the 2019 sites, but I'm focusing on four of the pollinator habitats, two from the mountains, one from the Piedmont, and one from the coastal plain. 
And the specific species I'm focusing on are the European honeybee, the common Eastern bumblebee, the Eastern carpenter bee, sweat bees, and the sunflower bee. Um, you can see their Latin names there. <laughs> um, but these were some of the most abundant species and they had different characteristics, which made them good target species. And you can see two of the pictures here of some of those foragers. So um, taking you through my lab methods. So first I went through and picked up to 10 female individuals of each focal species, trying to pick some that were take uh, samples that were collected throughout the field season and collecting pollen grains on the body using a dot of this frozen fusion uh, jelly dye, which is that, that purple stuff, the jelly dots there. Um, and then, so I took that and collected the pollen grains off of the bee's body, then collected it, um, put it onto a microscope slide and melted it on a hot plate for a few minutes, put a slide cover on that, and then looked at it under the microscope for uh, 40X at six different fields of view. I um, counted how many of the each of the individual different pollen types there were on each of these specific types of view, and then uh, used Excel to calculate the percentages of the pollen grains that, from the flower that the bee was actually collected on versus pollen grains that were um, from a different species that looks a little different. And so th some of these pictures show um, some of the different stuff that from the lab. Um, this picture right here is what is an example of what the um, what it looks like at 40x under the microscope. So you can see like I was counting up each of those individual pollen grains. So for my first hypothesis, uh, here is our, some of the results of our preliminary analyzation. So the x axes here of each of these charts show whether the species is native to specifically North Carolina or not, or if it was found in one of the pollinator seed mix that were planted from American meadows. So that count category on the left um, basically represents if the um, flower was blooming in the field and also there was a bee found on it, depend, no matter the species, just there was at least one bee found on that sp species of flower. So the maximum of that being 24 for the 24 different sampling events. And we analyzed this using a one-way ANOVA on jump and no statistical significance was found for this, for the non-native versus non-native flower species, suggesting that whether a flower is indigenous to North Carolina does not necessarily have a large impact on its likelihood of bee visitation. However, it is statistically significant uh, with a p-value of 0 0.0033, um, that whether a flower was present in the pollinator seed mix, that there would be a bee found on it, suggesting that uh, the flowers that bloomed from the seed mix might be a good indication of bee presence on the habitat. So um, furthering this, we can see here some of the top three flowers that had some of the highest diversity of bee visits um, based off of their genius and not necessarily the highest total visits. Um, so let's see, you can see on right there some of the various different genius here, but we wanted to highlight um, in the percentages the dark pink is Flictus, the dark green is Svestra, the mint green is Bombus, and the light purple is Xylocopa. And out of these three flowers, only the blanket flower is actually native specifically to North Carolina, although all three of them were included in the pollinator seed mix, which um, again supports the idea that it, uh, presence in the seed mix might be a better indicator of diverse bee visitation. So now moving on to my second hypothesis, um, I've so far completed the pollen grain analyzation for three out of the four of these selected sampling locations. I've analyzed a total of 71 bees so far, and we used a chi-square analysis on jump to create a gradient bar here um, that shows how many different pollen types were found on each bee genera. So each block of color represents the percentage of bee individuals with each genus that had a specific number, zero through six of the numbers of pollen grains that were found on them. Um, so this was found to not be statistically significant, and therefore I don't reject my null hypothesis here, meaning there's not a significant difference between the number of pollen grain types found on the different bee genera. However, when we simultaneously consider the bee genus and the flower species in relation to the collective pollen grades, we get much more interesting results. Um, so we use a multivariate ANOVA in JUMP to analyze the pollen, uh, pollen counts here. The x-axis is six of the different flower species, while the y-axis represents the percentage of the pollen grains that were found on each of the bee that were considered to be from the flower that the bee was collected on um, to kind of get an idea of fidelity 
uh, in that way. So each color represents a different B genera. And when effect tests were completed, we found that the foraging patterns across the different flower types and different B genera were significantly different from each other. So um, as you can see here, the highlighted numbers show that the P values were statistically significant, uh, less than or equal to 0 0.05. Um, which suggests that the different bee species collect different percentages of pollen based off of the host flower they're visiting. Um, all that to say, it's complicated. Each bee is different. Each flower species is different. Um, and you know, collecting more data will probably increase these significant results. But there are some interesting patterns that emerge. I want to highlight specifically the yellow one is the honeybee, which is generally considered to be a very fidelic species. Although this shows that that might not always be the case. Um, you can see that yellow bar goes down into the 20% fidelity range, which is pretty low. Um, and the orange one is the Sevastra, so that's the uh, sunflower bee. And you can see that they are much more fidelic to black-eyed Susans and zinnia flowers than they are to blanket flowers, which have, you know, you see the lower, it's lower down in there. So overall, I have rejected my initial hypothesis one that native plants will attract different types of pollinators and non-native plants. And my results instead suggest that whether or not the flower was present in the uh, pollinator seed mix is a better indicator of diverse bee species visitation than whether or not it's native to North Carolina. Um, so, and I have also rejected my second hypothesis <laughs> um, that the different bee species will have different numbers of pollen types because that is a um, too simplistic of a, uh, a generalization to make. It is much more complicated than that. And while the differences between the amounts of pollen types are not statistically significant when you consider the data in one dimension, when um, floor fidelity seems to vary when simultaneously consider the bee genius and the flower species in relation to the collected pollen grains. And um, despite all of this, there are still some really interesting patterns that have emerged that can give us insight into what different bees are selecting on different habitats. And I am still gonna keep continuing to analyze the pollen grains and add to the data. We did come at, run into some challenges um, with not being up to 10 individuals per species for all of the sites because um, there were so many different bees that were collected on the habitat. And um, I think having a larger sample size could be um, a good thing to have for this project and really narrowing down from the beginning on specific species. Um, let's see. So potential applications for this project include furthering the knowledge of the focal bee species foraging patterns and floral fidelity, which can have conservation applications if uh, people looking to plant flowers um, use these findings to increase the preferred habitat availability, and that would increase the overall success of the bee communities and promote species diversity. Um, Further research includes an, uh, new analysis and more samples and beginning to examine the why between the foraging patterns that emerge. So I applied for the OUI grant for the summer to consider to continue um, counting these pollen grains and go out into the field and collect new samples that can continue to support these findings. I'm also planning to partner with someone at Mississippi State University to test nutritional quality of these flowers. And um, I've gotten a grant to look at sunflower pollen um, and their potential to uh, cleanse bees of pathogens. And so I'll be doing more stuff with that to kind of look at why some of these patterns emerge. And huge shout out to Dr. David Harpy, Dr. Hannah Levinson, April Sharp, and the NCCU Apiculture Lab for all their support. And thank you guys for listening. Um, enjoy these memes, but uh, <laughs> does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I think um, when American Meadows created the seed mix, they did a pretty good job of um, finding things that are good at growing where they're being planted. Um, so I specifically looked at native to North Carolina specifically, although a lot of the plants in the seed mix, while they weren't native to North Carolina, they were native to the um, Northern Hemisphere, so they're native to Mexico or the um, Southwest or something like that. So I think there, it's more of a, a scale thing. So not just focusing on native to it growing where it was grew originally, but things that are good at growing where they were and they still have that kind of relationship, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. the pollinator and the flowers. Yes, thanks. Um, I have just a question. Yeah. Um, 
something of that for the plants that were versus were not in the seed mix. Well, I think that other things that seed mix that is growing in the plants, like the like seeds or the, the um, yes, like so with additional seeds from outside the mix. Yeah, so there, um, that included a lot of different plants. So there was a lot of weedy species like clover, um, bumbleweed, but there's a, a bunch of different plant species. Um, there was also crops that were grown around. So soybean was a notable one, corn, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of different pollen types that were found that were not necessarily in the seed mix. Oh, I have a question, Ren. Yes. Do you think that there's like an interaction between the fidelity? Like mm -hmm. I noticed there's very high fidelity for zinnia and black-eyed Susan, mm -hmm. and those tend to be included in seed mixes. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's an interaction effect there that, you know, you see more visitation in seed mix because it includes those species that have high fidelity pollinators? Yeah, um, I think that's totally um, a fair a point to make. I think um, presence in the habitat and availability in the habitat is also a really important factor in all of this. And, um, you know, if they are if there's a lot of these types of flowers, if there's you know history of these bees pollinating these flowers, I think they're more likely to continue to do it as well. Yeah, that's, thank you about your extension website and yeah. you know all of your suggestions of like plant types to mm -hmm. to plant and maybe that becomes like spread some seed mix. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, awesome. but it's good to see that the um the American Meadow Seed Mix did a pretty good job and mm -hmm. that the bees were actually liking what was in the seed mix. That Absolutely. was good to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think that that's something that I want to continue to look at. That's um, a question that I haven't really delved super deep into yet, but that's something that this summer I want to look at more as to really get into the why of why some species are preferred over others. Um, there's definitely theories, um, but I think some factors that could be is the, um, obviously the, the availability and the, the um, the season, seasonality of everything, um, along with, you know, the the pollen types. We're looking maybe pollen shapes have an, have something to do with it. Maybe there's a, a it's a scent thing or a visual thing. I'm I'm not really sure. That's a great question that I'd love to explore more. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> And we have somebody in the chat. Oh, nice presentation, Katie. Chip, are you ready to go? Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna start this and go back. All right, so you're ready to use the clicker. Oh, uh, just the right button. Yep. Okay. yep. If you ever wanna use the laser pointer, the big one in the middle. Yep. Cool. Don't blind the audience. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Chip. I'm a senior graduating with a zoology degree this spring, and I chose to do my project on the spatial and temporal habits of cats on Big Pine Key. All right. So um, just as a little bit of background knowledge, cats have... Great. Okay. So cats have completely taken over the world. They are the third most destructive species on the planet. And annually, they kill 6 billion birds and 22 billion mammals. Um, they are particularly a threat to island environments because islands contain a lot of specialist species. This means that they've specially evolved to occupy one specific niche on that island. And cats are generalist mammals, which means they're able to cover a wide variety of niches. So when a large mammalian predator arrives to these smaller islands, the native specialists don't really have evolved defenses for these mammalian species. Cats have played a role in the extinction of 33 endemic island species across the globe, and they're particularly a threat to the species in Florida because species such as um, the marsh rabbit, the Key Largo wood rat, and the Key Largo cotton mouse 
are all already at risk. So the additional threat of cats on these islands is really dangerous to them. Um, currently cats in Key West, Big Pine Key and Key Largo are managed via trap neuter release programs, which are where um, the government will set out traps, they'll trap the cats, neuter them, then release them. But due to the reproductive strategies of cats, these programs are minimally efficient and don't really have like great proven results. So I chose to work with Dr. Michael Cove on this project. Dr. Cove has done two projects in the Keys so far, analyzing the spatial, temporal, and population statistics of cats here. Um, he, in 2018, he found cats to be a threat to be endangered endemic species, such as the marsh rabbit. In 2015, he published the original study that I'm comparing my data to. Um, they use camera trap data, stable isotope analysis, and collected fecal samples from Big Pine Key and Key Largo to study the population of cats and how they were affecting the native wildlife. For my project, I asked three big main questions. First, I wanted to know how the population of cats on Big Pine Key has changed since 2015. I wanted to know what the movement and activity patterns of cats could tell us about their population. I want to know how scat samples from 2015 could give us more information on their diet. I hypothesized that since 2015 in the original study done, the population of cats has increased and they'd be moving more in between the field sites that we had. For reference, this is a map of Big Pine Key. Um, Big Pine is kind of like, Big Pine is where my study was done. It's a maze of lowland marsh habitats, um, higher level communities where there's neighborhoods and coastal plains. Um, each black dot on here is where a field site was with a camera trap. And it was important to identify uh, similar cats that were moving between camera trap surveys because that was proof that there were more feral cats on the island than indoor, outdoor household cats that had a smaller home range. For my procedure, I chose to split it up into three parts. First, I used wildlife insights to analyze camera trap data from 2022. This was taken over three months in the course of spring from March to May. Then I integrated this data into R, which is a statistical modeling program. Then I went to the museum and did the grossest thing ever, which was rehydrating eight-year-old cat poop and picking it apart to see if there was any evidence of consumed wildlife in there. This is an image of um, Wildlife Insights and what that program kind of looks like. The camera trap data is all online, so you don't even have to go to the keys to get the data back. It just kind of teleports it to this the website. Um, it takes an image of a cat, and then I was, I separated the cats into distinct, unique individuals based on fur coat, um, fur pattern, the time of day that they are active, and most importantly, these distinct markings. And if I thought two cats might look kind of similar, I would create a slideshow and then put these cats like side by side and look at what distinct markings these cats had. So, for example, this is specimen two. Specimen two is found at field site 25 and field site 144. And I originally thought, hey, this looks kind of similar. Let me set it up. And you can see like the markings on the legs here with the red circles that this is the same cat. It was found at the same time of day across multiple field sites. And it was about the same size of every image that it was caught at. This is an example of the data set that I incorporated into R. Um, R is just a statistical modeling program. I didn't have too much experience using this program before, but Dr. Michael Cove used this in his previous studies, so we thought it would be smart to use the same program moving forward. And this is an example of the rehydrated poop samples um, that he had had since 2015. We freeze dried these using silica carbon packets, and they stayed pretty much like fully intact since 2015. I rehydrated them using a strainer and just a container to catch anything that fell through. Um, cats are really good at ingesting bones because they need the calcium absorption through the bones and they're able to pass smaller ones. So I was picking through this poop to find evidence of bones, feathers, and hair. This is an example of a rat hand that was found in the first sample that we uh, rehydrated. I got really excited because I thought this could have been a wood rat but we had an expert look at it at the museum and he said it was just a ratus ratus, which is black rat, but I'm gonna still gonna hope it's a wood rat. Um, this is the model that we got obtained using R. This is big and scary, but the important data is right here on the right. Um, the probability of occurrence was 67.2% across sites and our density was 1.3 cats per square kilometer. 
for reference, uh, Big Pine Key is about 26 kilometers wide. So that's a pretty good number of cats for the island. Um, this shows that the cats were split up into three distinct groups. I'll get more into this later in my discussion, but just know for now, because of the data that we obtained through Wildlife Insights for analyzing how far the same cat was moving across different field sites, we were able to split these cats up into three different groups. These are some samples of the fecal matter that I pulled apart. Um, on the right, this is evidence of a bird that was swallowed. You can see some bird bones, which are very light and almost hollow. There's feathers in there. And if you look at this black part right here, um, that's actually a fully intact bird beak, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, the middle just shows more pelvic, femur, and tibia bones of most likely small mammals, most likely rats. Um, the cats were also ingesting a good amount of trash and plastic. Uh, there were cases where I would pull out full pieces of saran wrap that were like five inches long, just curled up into a little ball. So back to this model, um, there were three distinct groups of cats that we pulled out from here. The first was um, community like uh, colony cats. This is when people or as a community will leave food out for a group of cats. The cat forms a colony. They hang out around this neighborhood and they don't really move too far because they have their small home range. They know where the food is going. They don't really have a need to go out and hunt. The second group was indoor outdoor cats. This by far made up the largest percentage of the group. This is 77.4%. 70, and they had the smallest home range by far. This is likely due because due to them already having a distinct territory, cats are very territorial animals and they don't have a need to venture beyond that territory because they're not doing too much hunting. The third group was by far the smallest. This was the completely feral cat group. They had the largest um, home range of 701.4 meters between field sites and they only occupied 1.6%. When I compared this to the data found in 2015, feral cats had decreased from 7% to only 1.6%, and the entire population of cats had decreased as a whole. In 2015, Dr. Cove found 54 unique individuals. Oh, shoot, I think I just turned this off. Okay. The back? I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, I was holding this too tight. Three point. Oh uh, yeah, this is great. Perfect. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So Dr. Cove found 54 unique individuals. I found only 26. There are a few events that could have influenced this change and the um the individuals that we did find were moving shorter distances in between field sites. So if we look at the history of Big Pine Key, it's um, closer to the equator and is very low sea level or low to the sea level and is at risk for major storm events. In 2017, Hurricane Irma hit the lower keys and was completely decimating for Big Pine Key. There were storm surges of eight feet and winds at 132 miles per hour. Any cats that were not brought indoors at during this storm event were likely like washed away with the hurricane and the storm surges created flooding which restricted access to hunting sites for any cats that did survive um on that note of rising sea levels sea level is rising every year in the keys it, it rises by half a centimeter each year and since the original study was done in 2015 it has risen by almost 10 centimeters this doesn't really affect the cats directly too much but it affects the prey that they hunt the marsh rabbits wood rats and birds that they hunt all depend on the native plant vegetation, but that plant vegetation is being affected by saltwater intrusion. So a die-off in plants is causing a die-off in the prey species and subsequently could be causing a die-off in cats. The marsh rabbit population, which is endangered, but is what the cats prey on, has decreased by 50% since 2015. We, um, me and Dr. Cove aren't entirely sure if this is because the cats have been preying on them or because of the hurricane or a combination of both. But judging from the scat samples taken um, in 2015 that I rehydrated, we do know that for at least feral cats, a large part of their diet is made up of native wildlife. And it does, it is proof that at least feral cats are preying upon native wildlife. They're depending on that as a food source. And if that's decreasing, then the cats are decreasing as well. 
I think this leaves a lot of room for future research because this is a really good example of a longer term study that was done in the same site and can be really easily monitored for a low budget. Um, in ecology, it's really important to have these long term research projects. And I think this is a really good example of how cats as an invasive species can influence an island ecology, but the island itself is also um, adaptive and changing and can influence the population of the invasive species. I'd like to thank Dr. Cove a lot. Um, he's not here right now, but he was really helpful in all my research. And this was my first like kind of independent research project and it was a great experience. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't assist in the project in 2015 because I had just graduated eighth grade. But <laughs> um, I, yeah, we used the same criteria. Um, the criteria to separate cats into groups was mostly based on what we know about cats, how they move around an island, and how they were moving around the field sites. So the longest range of cats also had the shortest range of detection. That 1.6%, which were the feral cats, had the lowest detection rate, which was the um, G0 in that statistical model, but they were had the highest distances. And feral cats are completely fair, like completely truly feral cats are not reliant upon any sort of human um, food sources. So unlike these colony cats that were staying in a shorter home range and had a higher detection rate, they would be much more inclined to be traveling from one side of the island to another side of the island just to find like some source of food. Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so are you are you Australian? Yes. Okay, so I did a previous paper about cat management with respect to Australian techniques. And in Australia, um, lethal control is a really big uh, way they manage their cat species because Australia has a lot of endemic species there and they feel differently about cats. They feel more strongly about their wildlife preservation as opposed to cat uh, safety. Uh, we, as Americans, prefer cat well-being over native wildlife well-being, or at least like as a general public. So lethal control is a little bit spotty, and I think, honestly, like maybe illegal in the Keys, because there's also the um, Hemingway cats that are there. They have six toes. They're kind of like a big tourist thing, and they you know, attract people there. So people in the Keys like do love their cats. So lethal control is kind of a touchy subject when it comes to management. So that's why trap neuter release is a big uh, program that's down there. But trap neuter release it gets tricky when you look at the reproduction modes of cats. Yeah. Yeah. Only. I think I showed every cat that had the clipped ear. There were only two of them that did. Um, those are likely colony cats. Like I said, like the ones that um, are being actively managed by the trap and release program. But again, that's only 20%. And even if like a cat like is neutered, there's still like other cats that can be like just as good at reproduction. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like neuter spay. It's just easier to say one. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Now the big question, is Emma Wilson here? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> I think I haven't seen you since before the pandemic started. So it's awesome to be in the same physical space again. Welcome. Not this one. Oh, when you click on the wrong window, it goes to the wrong window. Did you know? All right, pro tip. You should have seen me trying to figure out this room earlier. Thank you again, David Tarpey. All right, I'm going to advance your slide really quick so that you are now ready to go. That's your advancer.
if you need to go back. Thank All right, you. without further ado. All right, hi everyone. My name is Emma Wilson and I'm gonna talk to you about the impact of shading on a spring ephemeral. Okay, so a little bit of big picture stuff. Um, we know that climate change is anticipated to cause earlier and prolonged canopy closure. So thinking leaf out in plants, um, and that's going to decrease light availability um, on the forest floor. And so these warming conditions are predicted to have developmental and reproductive consequences. So thinking impacts to carbon assimilation, um, reproductive consequences of um, on fruit and, and seed set, and then potential decreased opportunity for stratification. And then this results in phenological mismatch. So that's just when interacting species change the timing of their key life history events at different rates. And so spring ephemerals are a really interesting um, group to study the idea of phenological mismatch uh, due to their unique life history traits. So uh, they're long-lived perennial herbs um, found in temperate deciduous forests. Um, and they overwinter as bulbs, and then they grow in a really, really brief window between winter chill and canopy closure. And so they really maximize that short window of highlight availability. Um, and they're characterized by that really, really short um, life cycle where they grow into nests within three months, but they maintain that underground structure. Um, and because they need that, that really quick growth, they have high photosynthetic rates and high nutrient needs. Um, and then pictured, pictured here, are two local spring ephemerals, which some of you may have seen if you've been out and about in the woods. Um, and so that's the Dutchman's breeches and round lobed hepatica. Great. And so uh, because of their unique life history, uh, spring ephemerals could be uniquely vulnerable to climate change. And that's because there's this window where uh, of abiotic conditions that they have to track, and climate change could potentially be shifting it. And so we know that they're specifically adapted to grow in this window of highlight availability. Um, and then climate change could directly be impacting them by moving um, winters. So having, having shorter winters and then um, premature um, springs. And so this window could be, be shifting for them. And so even if the spring ephemerals are able to align their phenology with like this changing climatic regime, then they also have to synchronize their phenology with the timing of leaf out in these forests in order to maximize their fitness um, and, and really capitalize on that highlight availability. Um, but we're not really sure if these processes are going to be occurring at the same rate, um, different rates. And so there's a lot for them to, to juggle um, while they're growing. And so it is very costly for them to maintain these above ground structures. Um, they have to put in a lot of time into just building the leaf and then there is the maintenance costs of these leaves. And so it's really important in terms of their fitness for them to, to track these conditions and respond accordingly. And so we are seeing um, that warming temperatures are a significant predictor of leaf out in um, our area. And so this idea of phenological mismatch um, is well within the, the realm of possibility here. Great, and so specifically, we were looking to understand if increasing the duration of shade prompts earlier leaf senescence in Erythronium um, umbilicatum. And so senescence um, is just the degenerative stage of leaf development. Um, so thinking old age in plants where chlorophyll production um, and photosynthesis is halted. So our hypothesis, this is just a, a visual representation that we put together. Um, and on the y-axis, that's um, net energy uh, gain per day um, over time. And so uh, zero is in the middle. So anything above the line will be positive. Anything below the line, that's negative. And so initially, you can see for both um, control and shaded plants, they're going to have about the same um, energy gain per day because uh, regardless of, of their surroundings, they still have to put in that initial investment just to build the leaf. Um, however, then the plant reaches the point where um, they, through photosynthesis, have gained back what, they, what they've invested in building that leaf. And so they're able to make like a net profit um, of energy for, for that leaf. And then, so we predicted that the ideal time for senescence to occur would be at that peak. Um, 
because after that point, um, the plant is still gaining energy, but then they're gaining energy at a decreasing rate. Um, and so, um, meanwhile, all of this is happening. The plant is having to make to make these trade-offs between maintaining the leaf and senescing. And so, to explore these questions, we looked at Erythronium umbilicatum, and climate change we know is a concern for all spring ephemerals worldwide. Um, and this this one aligned really well with with our research timeline. And um, so, this is the one that we chose. It's known as the dimpled trout lily. Uh, and it's a native perennial. It grows from bulbs and forms colonies um, in moist, deciduous upland and bottomland forests. If you have been in the woods in the spring, you probably have seen it, whether or not you know it. Um, and here are just some, some more pictures because it's really a really beautiful plant. Um, so that's a, the vegetative stage and then it flowering. And then you can see the, the little fruit they produce. And so here is just a, a timeline of the phenology in our area. Um, so they, they're dormant for, for a really significant portion of the year. And then February comes around, they shoot up their leaves and um, flower often um, shortly after. It's like boom, boom, uh, leaves and then flowering we, we saw. Um, and then you can see that there's also a really, really short timeline between when the veg vegetative um, structures appear and, and when they begin to disperse those leaves or disperse the seeds. And so um, they're following that like three month um, window that most spring ephemerals seem to seem to follow. Great. And so a bit on our study design. So we conducted our experiment in the Duke Forest uh, where we had two study sites um, that were roughly four kilometers apart. And we deployed the shade, shade cloths evenly and randomly between the two study sites. And we had both shade structures and sham structures. So the shade structure is the dark, the dark one in gray. And then the sham structures were white, which um, we wanted to deploy just to make sure that um, the physical structure of the shade cloth, um, it could potentially have consequences on soil moisture or on temperature. And so we wanted to make sure that it was just light um, that could potentially be causing the leaf senescence. And then we also had the true controls where they were just, we identified a plot with the plants um, and uh, they were just experiencing ambient conditions with no structure um, deployed. And we took abiotic measurements as well on, on light, soil moisture and temperature. And so then within each plot, each individual received a unique ID. And then we looked for signs of leaf senescence. And so we broadly separated it into two categories. So we had like the early leaf senescence and the late leaf senescence. So early is just thinking um, anything where greater than one centimeter um, had senesce. And then late leaf senescence was where greater than 50% um, of the leaf had senesce. And so you can see like the tips are starting to appear yellow and they just kind of look sad. <laughs> And then we also wanted to make sure that our treatment was having the effect that we suspected that it would. Um, and so this is a, um, a plot that's showing the shade um, control and sham structures uh, and their impact on light. And so you can see that the median values for the con control and the sham are pretty much the same. Um, and then with the shade structure, it's much lower. And so that was pretty cool to see that, that it was having, having um, such an effect. And so for our results, um, we used a, linear, a general linear model in R to analyze the data. And so for shade duration zero, that's just the control plots that were just experiencing the ambient conditions. And for shade duration six, those were the plots that had experienced the greatest duration of shade. And um, we found that there's, there was not a significant effect of shade treatment on leaf senescence, which was pretty interesting. Um, and here is the same information just displayed a little differently with green being the plants that were still alive and, and, and um, photosynthesizing in the plots and then um, brown being the plants that had senesce. Um, and so you can see it's pretty much an even spread across the board. 
Um, and so a little bit about just like the challenges of implementing the study. Um, we were actually originally planning to, to look at the probability of flowering and then the probability of fruiting given flowering. But um, we reached a point in the semester where we uh, had over 400 plants in our plot and only four of them had flowered. And so we said, okay, well, there's not really a lot of statistical power to do anything with this. And so what else can we measure? And so we were like, well, everyone at some point is probably going to senesce. And so uh, we ended up shifting to leaf senescence, um, which we all saw, thought was a very interesting question, but just in a different way. Um, and then we also had to establish all the plots a lot earlier in um, the semester um, before a lot of the plants had even emerged underground. So we just put in so much time um, trying to say like, okay, this could potentially be a plot. How many individuals are here? And um, that took a lot of time um, as well as just deploying the, the shade structures while trying to balance monitoring the leaf senescence as well. And so some of the key take takeaways from our study, um, we discovered that there's no immediate response um, of leaf senescence as a result of shading, but I feel like these results still feel um, very preliminary um, because um, spring ephemerals are long lived and this is the first year of the study. And so it's possible that maybe they were relying on um, energy stores that they had developed from the previous year, and maybe it's not until the next growing season that we're going to see that impact. Um, but um, it's also possible that the plants are focusing on cues in addition to uh, the brightness of the forest floor and canopy closure to signal senescence. And so the story is probably a lot more complex than, than just canopy closure. And so in terms of uh, future directions, we really need more information on the energy gain and expenditure of spring ephemerals to really understand like what do those those graphs of of um, energy gain per day over time look like and then hopefully we can use like core data um, to understand photosynthetic capacity and and help um, develop a, a more clear story um, and then maybe one day that information could be used in climate projections to understand how spring ephemerals are responding to the climate change. And so a big thanks to, to Will in the back and to Melina for making, making the project possible. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to, to answer them or you can reach out. No idea. I. It's really, really interesting because we anticipated it would be like an explosion of flowers, um, because even within um, um, like areas within the triangle. So like this was done in the Duke Forest in like the Chapel Hill Duke area, and then in Cary Hemlock Bluffs is has also like large quantities of erythronium and that was like a carpet of of flowers and so I think we were all anticipating it would be very similar um but I'm not entirely sure what it was about about like this particular region because it doesn't seem or like this particular study site because it didn't seem to be like across our entire region so I don't I'm not sure very very interesting though it was a surprise Cool. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. So I have a question. Oh, real quick. Yes, sorry. Um, in your box plots, you had a lot more variation in light among your control plots compared to the sham structure. Yes. Did you have thoughts on that? Um. Well, I think it it just happened to to be where, like, so the control plots were experiencing just like the ambient conditions, mm -hmm. and so I different different trees were leafing out at different at different times and so if we happened the day that we measured to measure the control plot that just happened to be under a tree that le like had already leafed out then maybe it's going to be lower but then um some spots were just super super bright super super sunny mm -hmm. um but then when we measured the the shade structures um 
and their levels of light, they all have like the consistency of the shade structure itself. Right. And so I imagine like, it's but just not taking into account that. But even your sham structures seemed to have a lot less variation. It was a really thin box plot. It was in the middle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So do you think it's like diffusing the light somehow? Or it's possible just like the heterogeneity of habitat that was measured on that day? I think that was sort of, sort of our assumption. Um, yeah, it was just like the the specific habitat of where where we were measured the the light. But I suppose like it could be possible, and that would be like interesting in in like future studies maybe to look at. Yeah, I've inspired a follow up maybe. <laughs> I think um, the the plan, and we're still in the process because this is the first year of like, like what does this look like moving forward? Um, I think, I think the original plan was to, to remove them once like senescence had occurred and and um, everyone was was gone from the plots, um, and then now that they've been established and we know where they are and all the individuals had tagged, then moving in and establishing the, um, the shade plots in before they emerge in subsequent years. But I I think it could be done either way. And and since it's we're still in the process of planning, I think like we'll explore both options. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, y'all, it is 1131. I want to go ahead and keep us on schedule today because we have one, two, three, four, five, six presenters. Thank you so much for those of you who have joined us in person and online via Zoom. I want to welcome you to part two of the spring 2023 Applied Ecology Minors Research Symposium. Um, as a reminder, uh, the students presenting today have each completed an individual research project uh, that they mapped out with a mentor to identify a scientific question, then to collect and analyze the data necessary to address that question. Um, our mentors range from faculty to grad students and postdocs here at NC State, at um, other institutions of higher education, and beyond academia. A lot of students have worked with government, uh, state, and local agencies and NGOs and nonprofits to complete these projects. So there are many ways to apply ecology. If you have any other questions about the minor in applied ecology or about um, this AEC 492-493 research learning experience, please feel free to contact me. Um, and I'll note, we also have uh, one student presenting today who is presenting research that they completed separate from the minor, right? So opportunities within and toward our degree program, um, as well as beyond um, for individual effort recognition. So I wanna welcome you again all to the um, Applied Ecology Minors Research Symposium. And before we begin, I just wanna say congratulations again to the now 130 students who have graduated with the Applied Ecology Minor. Um, this is since I started tracking these data. And you'll notice our, our program has experienced tremendous growth um, since I arrived in fall 2019. So really, really grateful for all the students interested in pursuing applied ecology. Before we get started, I also want to acknowledge that this land was originally stewarded by the Skarura, Tuscarora, Catawba, and Lumbee tribes. Our goals in applied ecology are to study the natural non-human world around us and to apply what we learn to better manage or conserve natural resources. But it's important to remember that we humans are inherently part of nature, not separate from it. And that way before settler scientists decided this was important, expert knowledge and care for the natural world was already applied as an integral part of indigenous cultures. We are privileged to be able to practice science and to study ecology in academia, but I hope we all remember that the Western, the scientific, the academic way is not the only way, and it's not even likely the best way. Acknowledgement is a form of decolonization, 
dismantling an existing power structure. In order to change systems of oppression, we need to first acknowledge that the system is built on oppression. North Carolina State University is a land grant university, which means it originally received funding through the Morrill Act, federal legislation that bought or forcibly seized lands from indigenous tribes across the United States. The sale of indigenous lands raised $134,920 to fund NC State originally. That's the equivalent of $3,810,578 today. I hope that we can disrupt and dismantle colonialism beyond a simple territory acknowledgement by supporting and empowering each of you, our students, as scientists. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters, um, starting with Elizabeth Mitchell. So I'm gonna swap our PowerPoints and let you all get settled in. I know we need the music from the elevators, you know. So I'm going to click it once, and now you are ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, my name is Elizabeth Mitchell, um, and over the course of the semester, I was doing research <clears throat> with red flower beetles, um, and we were specifically working with um, a uh, phenotype called the Goliath phenotype. Um, and so I have Goliath beetles with giant potential. Um, and so a little bit of an introduction about the red flower beetle. Um, they are a model organism um, with a sequence genome. So we know a whole lot about them um, and it makes it a lot easier to do genetic work with them. Um, they're pretty easy to rear and house. And so you can see, I have a picture of uh, some of my jars that I was using to collect samples from. Um, they have a short generation time of about five weeks. Um, and so that makes it um, <laughs> a lot easier to go from embryo to larva to pupa to adult. Um, and they lay eggs daily, so it's um, easy to get samples every day or every other day. Um, and then we have over 100 years of genetic studies working with them. So again, adding on to that knowledge um, that we have. Um, and then um, for anybody that's not super familiar with insects, um, I'm going to be referring to larva, pupa, and then also the adults. Um, and those are all the same organism. And so then an introduction to the Goliath phenotype or GO. Um, it is a mutant strain um, that was produced via gamma irradiation back in the early 90s uh, before we had um, really reliable targeted gene editing. Um, and this specific mutation is a deletion of about 143,000 base pairs, um, so it's quite a lot. Um, and then previous work um, by a grad student here at NC State um, determined that um, four milligrams was the cutoff. So anything weighing above four milligrams would be go-like, and then anything weighing below four milligrams would be wild type. Um, and so I have a picture of some of my pupae. Um, they're labeled, so you can see that the go one is a little bit bigger than those two wild type ones. Um, but the really big indicator here is the beetles. You can see that that wild type beetle is a lot smaller than the goliath beetle. Um, and so I'm sure many of you guys are aware of insects as alternative protein sources. Um, and, you know, they're very high in protein, they're easy to produce, um, and they're highly sustainable. Um, and so this is the main application um, that we're working towards for this phenotype. Um, and so uh, mealworms are a very commonly farmed insect, and they happen to be very closely related to the red flower beetles. And so we hope to be able to transfer this Goliath phenotype over to the mealworms um, for use in industry production. Um, sorry. Um, however, there are still some bumps that have to be smoothed out before we can properly apply this um, to industry. Um, and so this is where the targeted gene editing comes in. Um, and so for uh, previous work, um, we used genome editing CRISPR to confirm that 143,000 base pair mutation. Um, and so work by Meredith, the grad student, um, she determined that by cutting out that segment, um, you can get Goliath presenting beetles. Um, however, this is a very large segment here. It's 140,000 base pairs. Um, 
Um, so for our objectives, we are working towards identifying what specific gene or genes actually cause the GO phenotype um, as this scope is huge. Um, and so we know um, that if both um, chromosomes are missing this segment, um, so homozygous lethal, sorry, they are homozygous lethal. Um, and so that causes a huge problem when uh, wanting to apply this to agriculture. Um, because we have to go through each generation, pull out those Goliath beetles, and then cross them um, to prevent just having dead beetles. Um, and so this is not efficient. And so this is where my project comes in, um, where we are working to try to target that segment that is being cut out. And so going from about 26 genes to six genes um, and hoping to improve both the survivability, but then also just further narrowing down our scope. Um, so now we have a better idea of where to look um, for those genes instead of that huge, huge segment. Oh, and then there's the little cuts, <laughs> forgot about those. Um, and so I started off uh, by injecting the embryos using a um, gas pressurized system. Um, I started off uh, with just red buffer. Um, they served as practice, but also as controls. Um, and you can see how teeny tiny that little needle is um, and kind of the setup there um, that we're using. Um, and then after I got more comfortable, I moved on to injecting the embryos with CRISPR components. Um, and so then here's a close up of the eggs. And so you can kind of see how they have to be lined up on the slide. Um, I have to place each individual one um, with a paintbrush. Um, some days I have 30, other days I have hundreds. So, um, then there's also here um, a representation of kind of the development of the egg. Um, and so they start off with just having a nuclei um, and then that one little nucleus um, or nuclei goes into a bunch and eventually they will go into having cellular membranes. Um, and so when we're doing these CRISPR injections, we're trying to get them early on before those cellular membranes have formed. Um, and so this shows my injection survivorship data. The blue is just the buffer, and then the red um, were the CRISPR injected embryos. And as you can see, there is a much lower survivorship in these embryos. Um, and so why? Um, that leads us to my two methods um, that we use to determine what is going on in these embryos. Um, that'll be molecular analysis and weight measurement. Um, and so method one, molecular analysis, um, started off with the DNA isolation of both injected eggs and a wild type beetle. Um, and so for both of these, um, for the eggs, I had injected some previously and set aside for this specific um, project here. Um, and so we were looking for embryos specifically that um, had signs of development as they're the ones with the DNA um, that has possibly been altered. Um, and so we took some of those, we took the good eggs, we scraped them off, um, and we muddled them up in buffer. Um, we did the same with a wild type beetle that had only been injected with buffer as an embryo. Um, and so then we ran the PCR reactions um, for a wild type um, sample, the crispr egg sample, and then we had a negative control, which was just water. Um, and we did a nested PCR. Um, so we had the two primers um, as an attempt to try to reduce noise and make the um, results more easy to read. Um, and then with those um, samples, we did gel electrophoresis, um, which I have pictured there um, to get a gel to read. And so here are the results of the PCR. Um, so to introduce the gel results, the marker is L and it serves as a reference um, for how long the DNA fragment is. The WT is the wild type. Um, the CE is the crispered egg. And that last one is just water. Um, and so then going back to the little CRISPR cartoon that I had before, I've located or I've placed arrows to kind of represent about where the uh, primers are. And so you can see that they're just outside of those CRISPR sites or where the CRISPR cut. Um, and so if CRISPR was cutting the DNA, we would expect to see a band of about 550 base pairs. Um, but if there was no cut going on, um, that segment of DNA is just too large. And so the primers would not be able to replicate anything. And so nothing will show up. Um, and so you can see that there is um, a faint band um, in the area that we're looking at. It doesn't show up as well, I don't think, on the screen, um, but there is something there. And unfortunately, it's really faint, likely because we just weren't able to get that much DNA out of those eggs. 
And then even out of that little bit of DNA, not all of it is altered. Um, but there is something there, I would say inconclusive, but it's still promising. Um, and so then on to method two, which was weight measurement. Um, and so as my larvae would pupate, I would weigh them out um, and then I would sort them. Um, so if they were above four milligrams, they would be um, sorted as go. And then if they were below, they'd be sorted as wild type, um, which all are being saved for crossing. Um, and so then results of method two, these are the really exciting ones. Um, so out of 11 inj injectees that survived, I had two that exhibited go-like phenotypes. Um, and so even though the PCR wasn't super conclusive, we do know that clearly something was going on and that the CRISPR was working because we have Rufus and we have Spencer. Um, <laughs> and so Spencer was my first beetle, not Spencer, Rufus was my first pupae that came out. Um, and that's her picture there. She's a beetle now. Um, Spencer, I got out, I believe on Tuesday of this week. Uh, yeah, and so uh, she was just, you know, right there, right on time. Um, <laughs> and so this is very exciting. And so then discussion, what does this mean for Go? Um, this shows that this region contains the gene or the genes that are responsible for the Goliath phenotype. Um, and so it's narrowing down that huge, huge window that we had before down from 26 genes to just six. Um, and so this will help future research target um, better, better target where, you know, know, better know where they should be looking for as opposed to just having that huge window. Now they can look at a couple genes. Um, and then also, if we're wanting to apply this to mealworms, it also helps to reduce the size of the DNA that needs to be removed in the mealworms as well. Um, and then challenges I faced, um, there was the low, low survivorship in CRISPR injectees, so making my sample size a little bit small. Um, occasionally, there were low egg yields, making um, a little bit more difficult to get those good, um, those good injection days. Um, and then also just the short time frame. Um, so far, I've only had this semester um, to work last semester was pretty wacky, um, but um, thankfully I found this position here um, and I hope to continue working on this project. Which brings us to future research. Um, pictured here, I have some of my cups. Um, those are all uh, containing larvae that I'm waiting uh, to pupate um, to eventually we'll weigh, out them, weigh them out um, and then sort them if they are go or wild type um, and then add them to our breeding pools. Um, we are hoping to cross go like flower beetles um, to test for heritability, um, but then also to test for that homozygous lethality, um, because as these beetles have a much smaller segment of their genome cut out, they may um, be able to have uh, homozygous beetles survive. Um, and then we also want to sequence those PCR products to confirm the CRISPR cutting just because um, the PCR was a little inconclusive, um, might be interested in looking at what's going on there. Um, and then just further pinning down what gene or genes are responsible, um, and then ultimately applying this research to the mealworms, um, because bigger mealworms have more biomass, more protein, and more efficiency in that industry. Um, and then I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Marce Lorenzen and William Corbasa. Um, they've been awesome, and I honestly can't thank them enough. Um, and then I'd also like to thank Meredith and Dr. Richard Beeman um, for their previous work in this field. And then, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, there's 26 genes that we know of. Um, I actually don't know specifically what those genes do, um, but the region that I'm looking at, I think I was told, has um, about six genes in it. Um, so it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, um, it's not as dense as the other segments that have been previously cut out. But I, I personally don't know what each of those genes do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> at least we have. Yeah. So, so, does anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much. Awesome. Of course. Up next, we have Sydney Beck.
Thank you. So good to see you here. Thanks for clarifying everything else going on. Sorry, so I have to go <laughs> and advocate wherever I can. Change the time. I'm so I'm gonna click and now you're ready. Okay. To okay. This. Yep. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Sydney. Um, I'm here to present on the mechanisms of submerged aquatic vegetation depletion in North Carolina estuaries, also known as SAV. So what is SAV and why is it important to us? So SAV are seagrasses in submerged yet shallow aquatic locations. Uh, these habitats are very critical to underwater life because they provide protection, nursery, and habitat for a lot of aquatic species. As many as 40,000 fish and 50 million small invertebrates are supported by one acre of seagrass in North Carolina estuaries. Um, they're also economically important to North Carolina. So North Carolina's fishing industry, many of the fish and shellfish species harvested rely on SAV specifically. Um, for example, blue crab, which have the highest economic value in North Carolina, uh, they rely heavily on SAV for habitat and food access. And then it also impacts our water quality and realty. So waterfront homes with um, more clear water in front of them are more viable for uh, property demand. And SAV increases the water quality by filtering and storing nutrients and improving the water clarity. And then also they sequester carbon, which is great, especially in terms of concerning uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, so there's an estimate economic loss of three to 80 million in North Carolina in the next decade due to SAV depletion. So these characteristics show how important SAV is to the health of our estuaries. Um, in terms of research on SAV, I helped conduct a research synthesis determining the health and degradation of SAV in North Carolina. Uh, we found there's limited knowledge in terms of where we're at with SAV in North Carolina specifically and we assess the current state of science and potential variables that may be involved in the depletion of SAV in general. Um, we did this and then used it to develop a framework for categorizing the mechanisms and pri prioritizing uh, their import importance relative to the apes in North Carolina, um, also known as the Albemarle Pamlico Estuarine System. So uh, we created this framework and then integrated it into an extension of an already developing economic framework so we can better prioritize our actions for um, improving SAV health in North Carolina. So here we have a map of um, SAV currently in North Carolina in our Albemarle Pimelco Estuarian System. Uh, so this was created using data from the NCDEQ and the NCDMF. Um, and it shows where SAB is continuous and patchy within the area. As you can see, it is mostly located on the sound side of the outer banks. And this is due to optimal depth and salinity in that area. But it could also be possible that anthropogenic activity and pollution near river mouths may be impacting the survival of SAB near the mainland shorelines. But a lot more research is needed to determine this. Um, although this shows locations of SAV, the NCDEQ hasn't been able to accurately map it over time to show the decline or potential, potential causes of decline uh, of SAV. And here we have our matrix that we created. So concerning previous research, as I said, something like this hasn't been created before. Um, when talking about SAV health, there's a lack of a single source that really provides important information on each of their mechanisms and relationships to each other causing depletion of SAV. Uh, we aim to fix that by synthesizing this matrix to better understand the potential factors of SAV depletion in North Carolina specifically and their overall magnitude of the problem to our location. Uh, SAV is heavily reliant on light availability in the water column, also known as um, light attenuation or the decrease of light availability as you travel down the water column. And uh, we use this as our primary variable for SAV health and success. So due to this, we determined that the primary mechanisms of SAV depletion were to be sedimentation and eutrophication, as you can see pictured. Uh, sedimentation on the top picture is excess sediment in the water column, and then eutrophication in the bottom picture is excess uh, algae growth in the water column. 
and both of these block sunlight from reaching the SAV. So North Carolina itself contains many non-point sources of pollution into our apes, uh, causing eutrophication and sedimentation. Some examples are agricultural operations, which is a big one, uh, fertilizer runoff and animal waste runoff from that causes nutrient loadings. Uh, we also have a lot of urban development on our shorelines and that causes stormwater runoff and wastewater and septic pollution. Uh, there's roughly 10,000 miles of rivers and streams that deposit directly into our estuaries and anthropogenic activities are also evident through dredging and boat traffic. Um, along with these main mechanisms, there's many smaller mechanisms that come into play and can really exasperate the effects of sedimentation and eutrophication. So here we made a diagram showing each of these relationships to each other of these smaller mechanisms. Uh, in terms of eutrophication, an angry, increase in algal growth is often caused by nutrient and herbicide loadings, and this can also increase epiphyte prevalence. Epiphytes are non-parasitic plants that grow on another plant, and they typically have a relatively healthy relationship with SAV in normal conditions. But um, under eutrophic conditions, their growth increases a lot, and they cause a thick crust on the SAV, which further blocks sunlight from reaching it. Uh, this also increases their disease susceptibility because phenolic acids, which are their uh, natural defense against pathogens, decrease in high nitrate conditions and low light conditions. And this is even evident in North Carolina right now, as we've seen some wasting diseases found in eelgrass populations. Um, in terms of sedimentation, increased sediment means increased turbidity, and this is often caused by erosion, anthropogenic activities, and transportation of sediment from rivers to the estuary. So areas of closest to the coast are of most concern for that. Uh, this can also introduce toxic metals because they attach to the sediment particles for example, sulfide is a phytotoxic compound and it impacts plant growth, fitness, and overall ecosystem function. So in terms of trying to fix this problem, restoration is extremely costly uh, relative to preserving current SAV populations. The price varies based on environmental conditions and restoration methods, but the average SAV restora restoration project costs roughly 50,000 per acre um, and the median survival rate is uh, about 38% one to two years after your project. So not super impressive there. Um, and not, a lot of people don't really want to fund that. Uh, monitoring and mapping of SAV is also very difficult because you need the right environmental conditions um, and it needs consistent funding. So overall, it's more cost effective to maintain current SAV beds before depletion becomes detrimental to our estuaries. And it's also useful to attack SAV depletion at its source, which we determined was nutrient and sediment pollution. So in conclusion, SAV is economically and environmentally important, and we're trying to stress how economically important it is as well, so we can try and get more funding for conservation of our seagrass beds. Um, eutrophication and sedimentation are determined to be the primary drivers of their decline, and there's a lot more smaller mechanisms that come into play that need to have focus as well. Uh, conservation is much more cost-effective than restoration. And we've provided now a singular source, uh, hopefully for reference for further research into con conservation of SAV. And there's definitely more mapping data needed in order to track its depletion currently in North Carolina. These are my citations. And I also just wanted to acknowledge Dr. Eric Edwards, Dr. Sarah Sutherland, and Emma Wilson uh, for working so hard on this project. They really dedicated their time for it, and it's been a pleasure working with them. And I hope to see our paper published in the near future. Eric just told me that it should be published sometime the next month, so we're excited about that. But it's going to be an extension publication to a publication on the economic importance of SAV. Yeah. Any questions for you? Yes. I think it's really difficult to transplant the SAV and also it provide it needs a lot of funding too and a, a lot of time and care. And a lot of times that's just not provided. Um, it's hard to 
Yeah, I, well, another thing is there has been some efforts for uh, restoration in North Carolina, but they mainly focus their water quality efforts on fish species and their health rather than the SAB specifically. So it's more like you're looking at water quality parameters for um, aquatic species that aren't the SAB itself. So I think that comes into play. Um, there's a lot of different factors that I can't really think of at the top of my head right now, but. I think so, yeah. As far as we saw um, data-wise, there were differing numbers quite a bit um, when it came to different water quality parameters. They're very sensitive because they, you know, take in so many nutrients from the area and everything. So. Yeah. Any other questions? We have a question in the chat. Oh, I do. I, what I'm going to do, I'm joining. Okay. So hopefully we won't get a feedback loop because the alternative is I'm going to do this weird spaghetti dance and try and reach that from only one view back here. So just one second. Um, while we wait, I'm going to say that was, I appreciate your use of bio render. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For mapping out the ecological uh -huh. underpinning. Emma, Emma worked on that mostly. She she really pulled that together, which was cool. So That's great. Um, Credit to Emma Wilson. When your publication, this is also a great chance to remind all students uh, and mentors, anytime you have a publication or a presentation or anything like that um, resulting from um, a minor project, please send me that um, kind of entry for our collective minors resume. Um, I'm just building a collective resume of like all the deliverables that come through. Um, yeah, right. let's see. All right. Oh, and I can't access the chat this time oh, because I haven't joined in time. Okay. So we're going to do the spaghetti dance anyway. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Am I? It is so dangerous. And or you might be so impressed. So impressed. All right. Come back with me. Maybe. I might never get it. It's so close. All right. There we go. Okay. Oh, nice. Got it. <sighs> the things you never, oh, and now it's going to be up here. Huh? Um, well, probably attacking uh, the sources of pollution that we know of, um, but obviously a lot of those are non-point, so it's very difficult to do that. Uh, that's a good question. Um, also, increasing uh, our SAV beds would benefit the removal of nutrients in the estuary because, or excess nutrients, I should say, because um, that's that's part of their job. They love doing that. So I I think it it's kind of a give and take. But if you if you really try and restore or conserve these beds, they should be doing that process themselves and improving the estuary. Um, in terms of methods specifically, I'm not really sure. But awesome, that's my answer. <laughs> Do you have any targeted goals for like where your um, who you should deliver this extension and publication to, to inform policy? Um, I think we're trying to deliver that to the NCDEQ or the state um, just to try and create a conservation or restoration um, funding and really attack it. Because we've done some conservation in the past, but like I said, it was focused on fish species. And I think really like showing them how economically important SAB is can really, uh, I don't know, set a higher bar for SAV. It's kind of like not really in the know. Nobody's really paying attention to it. But if we really like give it its attention that it needs, then maybe funding will follow. That's the that's the hope for the publication. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for your patience as I did that dance. <laughs>
now we do the the technological shuffle. As you may. And uh, there you go. Nope. Oh, my goodness. No, Ashley. Goodness. So sorry. Uh huh. Ashley. Just thinking the right name, clicking the wrong name, as one does in this last week of classes. And I'm just going to click once, and now you're ready. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Ashley. All right, so hello, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about bee diversity and fire in the Sandhills game land. Okay, so to start off, pollination is an essential ecological function, super important. In terms of humans, we obviously rely on pollinators, pollen in general, to pollinate our crops, whether that's by wind or by animal. And then plants themselves rely on pollination to complete their life cycle so they can reproduce. Unfortunately, pollinators have are under pressure right now from that's like climate change, habitat destruction, land use change in general, pesticides, and a variety of other factors. So we know from past research that bees actually respond positively to prescribed fires, which is incredible. However, there are still a lot of gaps in that research. So the one that I would like to address today is how does time after burn impact bee abundance and diversity? So people like land managers will care about this because they wanna know how often they should be burning their land if they want to increase abundance and diversity in their areas. Um, in the study I've mentioned here, the burns were done in winter, so there's room to explore things like what if you burned in a different season or anything like that. So for our objectives today, the main objective of this project was to understand how time after a prescribed burn impacts bee abundance and diversity. And I predicted that the most recently burned site would have the highest bee abundance and diversity, and that's for a couple different reasons. That paper that I mentioned on the last slide saw some results that said that fire kind of creates an open flower rich habitat that might attract and support more pollinators. Uh, sites that were burned every one or two years support higher diversity of flowering forbs than unburned sites, which is great. Species that nest below ground, they're protected whenever the fire goes through so their habitats are completely fine. Species that nest above ground, after the fire comes through, the dead wood is used as a nesting substrate for afterwards. So to look at our sampling sites, we have three of them, and all of them are located in Scotland County, North Carolina, with a three-year burn frequency. And this data was gathered in 2020 by the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, and they are also the people who manage the game lands themselves. So I did not do the actual sampling here. And I'm pointing this out because it's important for time period. Since these were gathered in 2020, we see that these sites were burned in 2020, 2019, and 2018. So the time difference is only about a year, two years. It hasn't been, you know, the full six years in 2023 here. So moving on to collection methods. Um, each of the three sites was sampled twice a day bi-monthly, so every two weeks about, over the course of six months. And there were 30 bee bowls set out each time. So what are bee bowls, you might ask? They are little bowls, as the name implies. They're painted with bright colors to attract pollinators to them. In the bottom, they have a little bit of water and dish soap, so the insects will fall in and drown. And from there, they can be pinned and identified and observed. So for our methods, this is where I stepped in for the project. It started with an absolute slew of initial data entry where I computed how many insects came from each site on each day. This information was then printed out onto these tiny little labels that I got to pin onto each individual specimen. And in total, I pinned a total of 1,754 insects, which is quite a lot. 
these first two pictures show kind of what the pick what the box would look like before as I started and then the second picture shows the same kind of setup of insects and you can see like a couple of big wasps stick out from the two boxes that you can see but that shows the difference and then the next step was identification so I worked through a guidebook of the common eastern bees in North Carolina so that way I could understand the important aspects of ID and I could, ident I could reliably identify down to the genus with assistance of Discover Life Keys. But I have to thank Dr. Youngstead here for really helping me out on the ID because I could not reliably ID down to species. It takes a long time to learn how to ID a large group of insects. But once the specimens were identified, it was time for data entry round two, which basically consisted of me holding a box and naming off numbers as Elsa would compute them for me. So let's talk about results. So we found that bi abundance was greatest at the oldest site, which was not, which was, excuse me, was not what I had predicted to happen due to this huge peak that happened in August and September. But it's definitely worth pointing out that that huge peak, pretty much all of it was consisted of these two species that I've put on the screen here. We've got Lasioglossum floridanium and Lasioglossum apopkins. And one more thing. Things that were not bees, like wasps or flies, were excluded from this graph and any of the following. So to talk about diversity, we found that diversity peaked in June and July. And the 2019 site stood out having higher species richness early in the season. And then that would contribute to its richness, which we'll get to in the next slide. The pictures I've got here, they're a little small, I'm sorry. But the top bee, the Lasioglossum pictum, has actually never been found in the state of North Carolina before. So this was the first one, but we are sending that off to double check on that one just to make sure that is what it is. So richness. Here we have a rare fraction ex extrapolation that shows kind of if we continued to sample, what results would we have seen? We found that richness was actually highest in the intermediate site. So you can see that we observed about 36 species in the 2019 site compared to, remember the 2018 site had the highest abundance? Well, it only had about 20 species in it compared to the other sites. And you might be wondering what the floral density looked like in these areas and if it relates to what we saw. We did see that floral density was the greatest in the intermediate site, which might have connections to the richness that we saw in the last slide. And yeah, that's just an interesting note. To talk about future research and what all this project is, this project is actually part of a much larger thing with 12 different sites over four years. The map that we've got here, the little spots in black show individual game lands. Um, the one that I did was this one in the very bottom here, kind of, Oops, sorry. but there were four game lands and there's a lot more to learn from the others. I was focused only on the Sand Hills game, land, which means that there's a lot more to learn from all these other ones. So to talk about further research and some more information. This study, as I mentioned, was done with bee bowls, but there was also netting that was used. And bee bowls may not show the exact population composition. Whenever we used bee bowls, we caught a whole lot of lasioglossum, like I said. I'm talking like hundreds of lasioglossum per like one or two of another species. So are lasioglossum just the most catchable or are they really the most abundant? And hopefully for future research using netting and in the other sites will give us an idea of if or if not that's true. Another thing to mention is specimen bandage. So every once in a while I would open a box and there would just be a couple of loose heads rolling around in it. And whenever you're identifying an insect, you need its head most of the time. So <laughs> those insects could not be identified and had to be excluded from the count. And acknowledgements, thank you so much to Dr. Elsie Youngstead for all the identification and for being so incredibly patient with me. 
I appreciate that so much. And of course, the entire Urban Ecology Lab, if you said hi to me whenever I walked in, I love you. And thanks to my friends for coming today. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, if you're me and you're not a pro, it takes about 10 ish minutes per B. But for a real professional like Elsa, I think you told me once maybe an hour or so for like a whole box, or is it a little more? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it definitely differs. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, the wasp stuck out and it was easy to exclude those. Also, just for reference, this photo is a picture of the ones that had been identified. And you can see. There's like four rows in here that are just slabby blocking for a game. reference of how many we've been looking at. <laughs> we have a question from Jim Nice online. Given that optimal conditions change fairly quickly from year to year, does that have any implications for how large or small the burn section should be? Hmm. That one I'm actually not sure about if I'm honest. Um, I believe they burn kind of different areas from time to time around in the same game land, but not 100% sure. And in general, insects will travel. So even if the burns were in different locations, insects from the entire general area could still be falling into a certain bowl. Future research. Yes, for sure. I have a couple of questions. So like about practice, do you ever, this is coming from like art world and not ecology world, um, but do you ever spritz with a fixative to like avoid loose heads? Hmm. I never did or saw anything like that. And I know they could be repaired if you knew which head it came from. I heard good old Elmer's glue is a good move for sticking a head back on, potentially. I grew up in a house with a lot of spray fixative. I don't know what that says about my childhood. Or, yeah, yes. And now we have that for posterity in a recording. Thank goodness. Uh, I was also curious. So you have your peak richness um, at that intermediate stage, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that feels like a, a pattern of succession, right? Where we have peak species turnover yes. those intermediate stages of succession. Did that feel... I don't know, perhaps that is the natural order of things. For sure, that can definitely be an accurate depiction. The 2020 site might have just not had quite enough time to like bounce back mm -hmm. as compared to the 2019, the 2019 site. And then of course, 2018 seemed like maybe it was, they gathered a lot of like the really common species, had plenty of time to reproduce. That could have been what caused our results. Some sites might just have been you know, different. I showed the floral density, but of course that's constantly changing. So yeah, so that gets back to your seasonal question too. Of course. And <laughs> yes. In the case of the 2021, I think it was about four to five months or so, maybe. Not 100% sure, but obviously we know the years. So burned in 2020, collected in 2020, burned in 2019, collected in 2020. All these were collected in 2020. So we at least know like the big chunks of time, but I don't have the exact month for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's different from species to species. So I don't know if I could give you an exact mileage, but um, I don't know. I'm very sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're good.
Yeah. Yeah. As this continues, for <laughs> Yeah. yeah. In this, in the future, since we saw that the 2019 side was kind of doing the best in terms of richness, maybe immediately after a burn, specifically at that site, we would see some great abundance and diversity. But like you said, that one site, the site A that was most recently burned, maybe it was just bad. So maybe in a couple years, we'll see it continue to stay bad and know that even with time, maybe that site just wasn't that great. But as I mentioned, this is part of a much larger project with 12 sites over four game lands. So we'll have plenty of data in the future to work with. Thank you so much. <laughs> And now it is Esme's turn. Sorry if I had your heart in your throat when I pulled up the wrong <laughs> presentation at first. Mm -hmm. We are ready to go. All right. Uh -huh. um, right. So my project is also relating to bees. So a little bit of a bee theme going on here. Um, anyway, my name is Esme, and my project is focusing on um, Andrina Barbara or Barbara's Minor, um, which there's a population that's on campus that we were primarily studying. So um, a little bit of background, um, Andrina barbara or A. barbara is um, a species of native ground nesting bee. Um, it's, there's about 1500 species of Andrina, so it's a lot and they all look pretty similar. They all look a little bit like this, um, but this one, uh, this photo is specifically taken um, on the site. Um, and the adult stage of this species is thought, thanks to our research, to occur sometime in mid to late February and like end around April. So they're a pretty, um, they're a pretty early pollinating species. Um, they are important pollinators for a lot of early blooming plants. Um, and yeah, so our nesting sites they they um were nesting in individual cells in the ground outside of module six of the varsity research building um primarily on the kind of right side of the building in that photo um there were a few in the on the left side but not nearly as many and so what, what we wanted to do was create a landscape design for the area that would benefit them rather than harm them. Because initially there was um, a plan to lay sod over the area and that would have killed those bees. So that's not what we wanted. Um, so we wanted to leave the nesting site um, bare because that's what they prefer for um, laying their eggs and collecting pollen. Um, but then the left side would be a landscape design. But we also wanted to study the species, um, figure out what they were pollinating around the area currently, and also determine why they chose to nest there. So first thing we did was um, consult 
a lot of literature to see what um, members of the Andrina genus in general, but also um, our species specifically were pollinating. Um, some species of Andrina are specialists and only pollinate one or two plants, but um, our species thankfully is pretty general. Um, we found that they appear to um, prefer uh, especially like ro um, family, no, rose family the genus um, and also kind of cone flowers, things like that. Um, but we weren't entirely sure. So that's why we also decided to um, do pan trapping or feebles as was already kind of explained. Um, we decided to um, select eight random areas using GIS around the perimeter of the varsity research building um, and place pan traps there. We initially just used yellow and red for our colors, um, though later we found that um, a lot of um, bees were spotted on Radford pear trees, which are around that area, and those flowers are white. So we decided to add white bulls and also build construct stands in order to raise them up off the ground to see if they would um, be caught there because we really weren't having much luck with the pan traps. Um, and then we also um, did a lot of sweet netting around the perimeter. Um, I can kind of explain it a little bit better here. Um, the purple pink lines kind of represent the um, roots we took when netting for a Barbara and then the blue dots are our sort of randomly selected areas. Um, we tried to do a lot of the kind of wooded areas around the building and up close to the retention ponds because um, we figured they would be over there. Um, however, this part of our research was not as successful. Um, we didn't capture any A. Barbara um, in our traps. Um, although bycatch was present, mostly flies, wasps, those kind of things. So we figured that the pan traps were working. We just perhaps should have used, um, we should have used white bulls from the beginning, I think. And we also should have used um, blue bulls or um, possibly like pink or purple bulls um, for reasons that'll be explained a little bit later. Um, and then sweet netting also yielded mixed results um, in just going around in the specific routes we had created. We only captured two bees um, in the, I forget how many times we did it. Um, but then when targeting the bee, um, bees, like finding them, um, pollinating specific areas, we were able to capture 10. Um, and those 10 were actually used to um, conduct the next part of our research, which was um, swabbing the bees to see what they were pollinating. Um, this part of the research is still sort of in process. We don't have all the data collected, but um, so far, uh, at least five different uh, types of plants have been found by analyzing the pollen samples in a, with a microscope and comparing them to um, samples from plants collected around the area. So um, pyrus, that's the most likely the pine trees that are in the parking lot by the Varsity Research Building. Um, and then Rosa, so a rose that's around there. Um, Rubus, there's a blackberry bush that, there's a few blackberry bushes that are around the Varsity Research Building and as well as mulberries is what Morris is. And then, oh no, Pyrus is the, my bad, Pinus is the pine trees. Pyrus is the Bradford pear. Confusion there. But anyway, that, um, can that, um, what's the word? Sorry, that it matches up with the research we did when um, looking at literature because at least in terms of the Bradford pear and the roses and the blackberry, because those are all from the family Rosaceae. Um, so yeah. And another thing we did to estimate the population 
of a, the population density um, that was in our area of roughly 1500 square feet uh, outside the building um, was we put up randomly selected areas and uh, attempted to count each of the holes that showed up from um, these emerging from the ground. And these sections were counted seven times between around when they started emerging. They emerged a little bit earlier than February 21st, but we had didn't have time to get it set up before then. Um, and then we, our last count was March 31st, and that's around when these started disappearing. We no longer are seeing them around anymore now. And so we also um, noted their proximity to the perimeter of the building, especially as um, they sprayed for ants around the perimeter of the varsity research building during our, our thing, which we did not want them to do, but um, at least not in that area, but they did it anyway. They weren't aware that something was going on there. So that was definitely a major factor. And also um, we noted what parts were in more sunny areas versus shady areas. So um, pretty much everything except for sections four and six are um, in sunny areas. Four and six are in relatively shaded areas. And so the results um, were actually relatively consistent after um, between after February 24th. Um, we the, on the 21st, we counted uh, something like 100 different holes in those nine sections. But then um, the rest of the counts were all around 150, uh, 140, 150. Um, and then the average nest cells, um, by far the most was in section three, which was con which is in the center of our site. So that correlates with kind of the rest of our observations. Most of the density of the bees was in the center of the varsity research building nesting site, um, whereas the perimeters were not as much, which possibly suggests some, some sort of edge effect. I'm not really sure. Um, and then in total, um, not accounting for density variation, we estimated that there are around uh, 3,259 um, nesting cells, or at least the tunnels that may not account for what's actually underground. It would be interesting to excavate one of the, well, fewer of the um, cells underground and see what's down there in the future. That's what we would like to do. Um, and there was some evidence that they seem to prefer sunny areas when it comes to nesting, um, but more research also needs to be done as, for that as well. Um, we would in the future like to also take soil temperature into account. Um, so yeah. And then kind of the final part of our project is the landscape design that I mentioned earlier. Um, we came up with this sort of concept um, based on our research and also general opinion of the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, here's some examples of what we're planning to include. Um, we're also planning to include, well, next year, it would be really nice to get uh, more of a pond area there, but for now we're planning on doing just a raised bog garden situation. Um, and here's the final thing for it. Um, the, uh, most of the plant species we are including are native, if not to North Carolina, then to United States in general, we felt that made sense considering the bee is a native bee. And yeah, so we're planning on planting all of these on Sunday, actually. So, and then, yeah, just acknowledgements to um, Dr. Jenny Fagan, who's in charge of the whole thing, and also Dr. Ernst, who uh, actually identified Andrina Barbara, which must have been very difficult to do. And then just um, my fellow interns who helped with this project and 
Um, also, the campus has a classroom program, um, which was responsible for funding the thing, the sustainability fund funded by this project and, and friends and yeah. Yes. <laughs> also, we were going to show that and Brenna was going to speak in today's in Boston, but Brenna was also going to speak in Boston. Possibly, yeah. But I saw that just about now. That's extraordinary. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, actually, I believe that is something that has been developed or I, rem I remember seeing I forget who it was somebody I've I've talked to um, did participate in something like that. Um, I think that we mainly tried to avoid capturing too many at the time because we also didn't, we didn't quite know how many there were. Um, I mean, there's obviously a lot, but we didn't want to, to adversely affect the population. Um, though it, it would have, it would be interesting to see how many we could catch if we did that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I I mean I think there could be um it's hard to say for sure there's also um a bunch of other sites that are around this area I know there's another um site that has a lot of um ground nesting bee activity on Centennial um there's a bit on Gorman I've even heard somebody talk about them being close to the um rose garden the ro like the little rose garden area off campus, so it would be cool to kind of expand our research and study those in the future. Jim Nice online asks, does rain complicate your emergence observations by obscuring holes? Right, yeah, that I forgot to mention that actually that did um, probably obscure some of our data. That's why I think we saw a decrease in some holes. Um, because rain did, in fact, wash away quite a few and make it a bit hard to see unless we kind of dug around a little bit. Um, and also our holes, the, the holes didn't take into account um, like what was what were the emerging bees from this season and also what was what they were if they were making any new holes. It, it's just, you know, they're holes. We don't know what what that means necessarily, except that bee activity is there. I'm watching drones in your future. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting for sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, I definitely did not circle back around to that. Um, I think that white and blue would have been more successful because white, um, the Bradford pear, those flowers are white, so that would have made sense. And then the um, blackberry and I believe mulberry flowers are blue or like a pink color, purpley pink color, something like that. So, um, yeah, that was my reasoning for it. Yeah, that's that's uh, that was something I had issue with when we were doing this um i think we only we used red mostly because um that's what was primarily used i think by the u.s fish and wildlife services when we were trying to figure out how to do this but yeah i insects don't see red very well so that's definitely 
probably a factor. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Kaylee Attix. Okay. <laughs> now I'm just going to go to Skyward. There we go. I guess so. Forward is this one? Yep. Perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Haley, um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, Australian walking sticks and whether or not um, the color morphs they display are due to stress and some other life history traits of the species in captivity. Um, so this is Extatosoma tyratum, um, also known as the giant prickly leaf insect um, and many, many other names. Um, it's native to the eastern side of Australia from parts of Queensland and New South Wales. And a lot of what we know about E. tyratum is from zoos and keeping them as pets. Um, they're a cool looking species. They're relatively easy to take care of and they have a mild um, defense mechanism. So it's a popular species to keep in captivity. Um, and there has been research done on the species in the wild, but the information is pretty limited. Um, so my project, project focuses not only on this particular species and its life history traits, but also the impacts of its interactions with humans. So we do know some about the life history stages of E. tyratum um, and that it goes through a series of mimicry throughout its lifetime. Um, in its egg stage, there it has a mutualistic relationship with ants. Um, the egg mimics an acacia or wattle seed, which is an Australian plant. Um, both the seed and the egg have a nutritious cap, which is attractive to the ants. So they bring them into their den and store them, which provides safety and warmer temperatures for the egg to incubate and also helps the species to disperse. <clears throat> um, in the first instar, it resembles a red-headed spider ant in both appearance and behavior. Um, it typically runs along the ground to find new habitats and also to increase dispersal, um, which is unlike the adult behavior where they really stay in one place the whole time. Um, second and third instars are dark and mimic, like the curled up edge of a senescent leaf, um, which is pretty cool. Um, they're pretty hard to spot <laughs> when they're that size because they really do look like the, the edge of a leaf. Um, the, then it goes through um, five to six molts before it reaches adulthood. Um, and before that, like right in the last instars before that, they look like a smaller adult. Um, and so in both of those stages, they can mimic a leafy tree branch like this. Um, and also their defense posture resembles a scorpion. They curl their tail up and they bob it back and forth and they stick out their, their four legs taut like scorpion pincers. So um, we also know that changes in color morphs are possible with this species, but it depends on the color of its surrounding foliage. Um, but they have to be exposed to this color from hatching. <clears throat> and um, this phenotypic plasticity uh, happens during development and is irreversible. Um, we also think that the species is facultatively phyliticus, where in the absence of males, uh, females reproduce via a type of parthenogenesis, um, where only female diploid offspring are produced and it's asexual reproduction. In the presence of males, it's expected that females will mate and produce both male and female offspring from fertilized eggs. So we do know some about E. tyratum, but there are also gaps in what we know about its life history. So we don't know the proportion of eggs that hatch successfully. Uh, we don't know the rate of mortality in the first and second instars, which seems to be pretty high. We don't know the length of time between instars and how long it takes to get to the adult stage. Um, we also don't know when secondary sex characteristics appear. We don't know the stress responses and behaviors. We don't know the rate that mating versus parthenogenesis occurs in a population and um, how being in captivity versus being in the wild changes behavior, lifespan, fertility and fecundity, and overall fitness of the species. So, um, so uh, let's see, yeah, sorry. So this semester I've been interning at the Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh, um, and we have E. tyratum on exhibit, which means we also keep a larger uh, population as backup. 
So this project came about because in the exhibit enclosure, there are two adult females. One is a golden yellow, um, what we see is like a typical coloration, and the other is a dark chocolate brown. And this is a picture of the two females there. Um, so we were worried that this adult was not in good health and that the darkening was an indicator that she was stressed. And we hypothesized that this could be due to kids tapping on the glass or the temperature or the moisture level not being quite right, or maybe just due to age. Um, but as far as I could find, this question has not been asked um, in literature. Um, we don't know what the function of the variation in color morphs is besides camouflage. Um, and I just found that different shades are a possibility. Um, and people are really only interested in the concept for aesthetic reasons, um, not health reasons or fitness level of the individual. Um, also, the literature states that E. tyratum only reproduces parthenogenetically when males are absent. Um, but since there are males present in both the backup and exhibit enclosures, um, I wanted to know if females were mating or not. So uh, my predictions are that color morphs are not due to stress. Um, and if, that, if they are, I would say that it was probably due to a, an increased level of disturbance, especially in the exhibit population versus the backup, because they get a lot of tapping on the glass. Um, and also that um, females mate and offspring um, comes from fertilized eggs. So there should be males in every new generation. Um, and there's actually evidence that females are mating here is a mating pair, um, and that lower picture is zoomed in on a, um, a sperm packet in the female's other positive. So. Yeah. so for this experiment, I collected hatchlings from the larger populations, um, randomizing which ones were from the backup or the exhibit enclosure. I put half in a container covered with green paper, and that served as my control, and the other half into a container covered with brown paper that served as the treatment group. The idea being that individuals exposed to a darker environment would turn a darker color morph. Um, the enclosures were identical in every other way, the temperature and humidity, light intensity and schedule of light, um, the types of, type of substrate and type of food, and the amount of water we gave them. So there was actually a high rate of mortality among the first instars. Um, I originally collected eight for each enclosure, but in the first few days, some of those died. Um, since most had either not molted yet or had molted only once, I supplemented with new hatchlings from either um, of the larger populations. Um, but after five days, most of the nymphs had molted um, at least once, some even twice. So I didn't supplement with any more because I wanted them to be all the same age. Um, so a few more died after that. So I ended up with four individuals in each of the enclosures. So I started with 16, supplemented with a total of five and ended up with eight, which is a 60% rate of mortality. Um, so that was really unexpected. Um, I also collected eggs from the exhibit and backup enclosures separately and put them into, excuse me, put them into an incubator. Um, after a few months, the nymphs were still really small um, and no eggs had hatched from the incubator, unfortunately. Um, and so, However, though, the, the nymphs that were growing were already displaying different color morphs and also adult characteristics. So in contrast to my expectations, um, the juveniles were in a range of colors and a lot of them were brown, which is not a color that I could definitively characterize as either a light morph or a dark morph. Um, so I classified them into like as, as three possible outcomes, um, which were yellow, brown, and black. So the yellow is quite golden, similar to an adult coloration, but the black and brown are also quite different from each other. Um, the brown shows some variegation like the yellow does, but the black has hardly any patterning at all because it's so dark. Um, so, and surprisingly, the proportion of the proportions of these morphs um, in the different enclosures was striking. Um, in the control en enclosure, which was the green one, um, the nymphs displayed um, either a yellow or a brown coloration, and the experimental enclosure, um, which was the brown one, um, the nymphs were either black or brown. So even though the populations were small, they still were very different. Um, and you can see these two pictures here are, it's kind of probably hard to see um, here, but whoops, that is. So here are the three black ones, and there's the brown. That one's the yellow one, and then the blue one. So, and then all eight of these individuals um, displayed female characteristics. So that was interesting as well. Um, so my prediction that color is not due to stress is supported, but definitely needs more data. And my prediction about mating in the population is inconclusive with the data that I have now. 
Um, so this was a smaller sample size than I wanted to work with, um, but the results for color morphs were actually surprisingly strong. So for statistical analysis, uh, we used a Wilcoxon rank sum test, also known as a man witten u test, um, to interpret the results. This test produces a p-value like a t-test, but it doesn't assume that the sample population is normally distributed, um, and my population was too small, so I would have uh, violated the t-test um, assumptions. So I used a numerical scoring as a proxy for incre increasing melanization, so one for yellow, two for brown, three for black. And the test produced a p-value of 0 0.06. So that's not significant. Um, it, it's above the alpha cutoff, but it is really close to that cutoff. Um, so that sh it shows that there really is a statistical trend here, um, that individuals are darker in the brown enclosure. Um, and either way, I would take a p-value with a grain of salt um, for this project because my population was so small anyway. Um, and so the other thing is that um, since no eggs hatched and my nymphs didn't reach adulthood, I can't definitively conclude anything about the ratio of males to females in the population because we don't know if these individuals are female or if they just haven't developed male characteristics yet. Um, so um, even though the statistical test pr produced technically a non-significant um, value, it's pretty clear to me that color morph um, does not indicate stress. However, uh, doing the research and asking this question made me realize the importance of knowing animals' stress responses. If we're rearing animals in cap captivity in order to release them um, back into the wild as part of a conservation project, we need to know how their upbringing in the presence of humans might affect their success in the wild. So this kind of research has certainly been done on mammals and animals we would consider to be sentient, but it's worth researching to see if we may be wrong about animals that are commonly viewed as like less complex than mammals. Um, since these results show trends but not significance, I would like to continue this experiment and repeat it in order to gather more data and get some long-term data that's um, a bit more conclusive about male-to-female ratios. And I would also like to know if nymphs lighten with age because a lot of adults are yellow and a lot of the nymphs that I had were like a brown or a dark brown. Um, and that could easily be determined by extending the study. Um, and in future studies like this one, we could track the male to female ratio across more than just one generation. We could do it across several. <clears throat> and we could also do a new experiment to try to determine the cause of variation in a population that's exposed to the same surroundings. So in the back of populations, there's a variation in color morphs, even though they're all in the same colored environment. Um, I would like to say thank you to Andy, Gabri, and Summer at the museum for helping both care for the little instars but also the support along the way. And also thank you to Dr. McKenney um, for helping me brainstorm before the project and also with the statistical analysis once I got my results in. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, let's see this, oopsie. That is, I wonder if I can play that video. I'm not sure if it will. Okay, well, anyway, that was a, just showing the, it sways, the animals sway like a leaf when you disturb them. It's pretty cool. But anyway, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Could be. Um, so something I didn't have time to talk about at all. Um, but it is related to the project is there's also a lichen morph. Um, so if you expose the animals to like a lot of lichen on the tree branches, um, they, they turn, you can look it up. It's like, they really look like a piece of lichen. Um, they're like mint green and black kind of stripes. Um, however, they do think that that's a subspecies. So if I were to expose these ones, even for several generations, they probably would never show that coloration. Um, so definitely could be a genetic thing. The other thing is um, that I didn't mention is that the phylogeny of this, um, these not just this species, but related species like this is not very well known. So they, it could be a genetic thing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm just curious about your lack of hatching in the incubator. Does yeah. the incubator like normally used for hatching or um, is there yeah. any parental care that the eggs might depend on? So they do have that mutualistic relationship with ants, but it doesn't 
previous research has shown that it doesn't, it's not necessary for them to hatch because um, the ants do eat that cap off the, off the egg, but um, it just wasn't enough time. They typically um, are dormant for several months and they can be dormant for like up to a year or whatever. So yeah, it just wasn't enough time. Oh, yeah. Did somebody else have another question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's pretty typical. I don't know if you know about that otherwise, but um, yeah, so it's just it's just females. If it's a strictly female population, um, they still produce eggs, but they're basically clones of each other. So, so clones, yeah, not... it's same genetic. Is that, well, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> right. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So it is different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yes. That's true. Yeah. No. So I didn't really get into that. Um, yeah. It's just something that has been researched in, in some papers like. Um, I think it's uh, Burke and Bondiuransky um, that do kind of some look into that, but it it doesn't it doesn't seem like these populations are following that actually. Um, if if there are more females in this population, even though there are males present, um, but if most of the offspring is is female, then that doesn't necessarily align with that. Um, it could be um, something to do again with because uh, I'm very interested in this because. Um, Supposedly, even though there are males present, like there are sufficient resources all the time and it's a very consistent environment, not like the wild. So that would increase the, for other species, that would probably indicate that they would parthogenetically reproduce because there's no need for mating. You know? So it could be that, but um, Right, exactly. Yeah, they just, I mean, and for stick insects, they're, I would think they're kind of a nuisance because they, they hang on, they hang on to the female. They're usually smaller, but they're like labor, like they got to carry them around, climbing up walls and everything. So <laughs> they just latch on. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know. <laughs> thanks so much. Hey. Yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs> and last technological note transition. Um, join me in welcoming Amanda Hoffman. Hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Hoffman, and today I'm going to be talking to you all a little bit about the germination of Hypericum hyperaquinis in Onothera fruticosa and in its response to varied periods of cold and moist stratification. So before I get into my research, I want to give a little bit of background information. So the southeast, which is this area in like the light blue in the lower right corner of this map, was historically characterized by frequent disturbance, and this is primarily in the form of um, anthropogenic understory uh, fires. And they occurred roughly, um, depending on the literature you read, it's one to six or zero to 10 years. Um, so it's a very frequent um, fire regime. And this frequent disturbance bolstered high light systems all throughout the Southeast. But as colonization took place, uh, fire suppression, and um, increased development kind of inhibited this disturbance. And so many of these like expansive um, highlight systems were reduced to remnants. And some of the remnants that we um, in particular see in North Carolina, um, in the mountains, we had the grassy falds. In the, long, um, the coastal plain, we had longleaf pine savannas. And where we are today in the Piedmont, we had um, open grasslands and open woodlands, colloquially termed Piedmont prairies. And as seen in this image, um, the remnants that we have today, especially of these Piedmont Prairie systems are restricted to the only areas left that are really um, characterized by frequent disturbance. And unfortunately these areas are like utility right-of-ways 
um, roadsides and other areas that kind of like escape the plow and escape development due to their uh, soil conditions. Um, and because these are restricted to kind of like dangerous systems and systems that we cannot implement fire because you can't burn on the side of 440 and you can't burn under a power line right away, um, a lot of restoration efforts have um, undertaken moving these systems into areas where they can be more uh, adequately managed and to kind of increase population size of a lot of the rare plants that occur in these areas. Um, and so restoration itself, it spans from uh, local governments all the way up to uh, federal agencies. So like US Fish and Wildlife and even includes some um, NGOs. And in order to effectively manage these systems, we uh, require a lot on uh, research so that we know more about these species and these systems that are otherwise kind of a bit unfamiliar to us because they are limited to uh, these relic populations. Um, and so that kind of takes us into like where my research starts. So my research is based off of my mentors uh, dissertation. So my mentor, Erin Eichenberger, did a uh, one part of her uh, dissertation on a prairie plant recruitment study. And in her study, she had two groups of species. Um, they were either highlight required species or they were generalists. And um, the seeds were sown directly into the soil for both species per horticultural recommendations. Um, and throughout her treatments, we saw no germination of two species, Onothera fruticosa and Hypericum hypericoides. And that kind of leads into my research. So I wanted to know whether or not this lack of germination was due to a uh, natural low viability of the seeds due to low maternal investment, or if it was something different, like a uh, need for a different method to break the natural dormancy that they were in. Um, so a little bit more about these seeds that I use in my study. So Onothera fruticosa is an identified high light specialist. So it means it cannot occur in um, where there's any like canopy cover. It needs to be in these highlight systems. And per literature, it's also associated with Piedmont prairies. Um, and the seeds are also very small and angular. Uh, there's a picture here of it next to a dime. So you can see how, how minuscule they are. Um, and then Hypericum, which was the other species that did not germinate, is a generalist species. So it can occur in these highlight systems as well as in a bit more um, like open forest. So there is some shade, like partial shade, uh, but it's not fully closed. Uh, they have also been identified as a weak association of Piedmont prairies, and the seeds are also small, but they are shaped differently. They're going to be more oblong. And so why exactly did I choose cold moist stratification as opposed to um, like gibberellic acid treatment or scarification? Well, first off, findings in similar systems, while not the same, Midwestern prairies um, have concluded that cold moist stratification is very useful for a lot of their herbaceous perennials. And also many um, wholesalers of native herbaceous perennials recommend cold moist stratification to break dormancy of their seeds. And um, kind of the mechanisms of cold stratification. So all of these plants are going to have um, a way to inhibit germination until it's eco or ecologically efficient for them. Um, and the plants that are gonna respond well to cold moist stratification are going to have a period of cold uh, followed by warm temperatures and light in order to uh, break this period of dormancy and initiate germination. Um, and so for my experiment itself, we had the two, uh, two species. There was 400 uh, seeds total per species and they were separated into 100 seeds per treatment into these four treatment groups. So I had um, cold stratification periods of two months, one month, two weeks, and then a control that received no cold stratification. Um, and for each of these treatments, there were four Petri dishes that were placed um, into kind of like general like Tupperware containers for easy transport. And in these four dishes, I had, um, or in each dish, I had two layers of blotting paper and they were also wrapped in parafilm to conserve moisture because that's the moist part of cold moist stratification. Um, and then so into, after they had been um, in the cold moist stratification for their specified periods of time, they were then transitioned to the growth chambers at the phytotron uh, to undergo the germination experiments. So the temperature regime for um, uh, my growth chamber was a fluctuation between 25 degrees Celsius and 16 degrees Celsius for day and night temperatures. And the photo period followed um, the recommended 16 on eight hours off. Those are both just general cold moist stratification recommendations for temperature and night. Um, and then every week I monitored um, for moisture levels 
I also rotated the trays under the lights so that there was no confounding variables with issues with the lights per se. Um, and then I recorded germination data as well. And this data um, led to my results. So unfortunately, we have no seeds of Hypericum hypericoides germinate. 33% um, of the 400 uh, seeds of Onifera fruticosa did germinate though. But in all dishes, there was substantial fungus growth within the petri dishes. But I did, after the fact, uh, take each dish under a dissecting scope and kind of check through the fungus and were rummaging to make sure there was no germination that I may have missed or any seeds that may have died and I just didn't notice until they became over taken by the fungus. Um, and then to kind of like visualize my results, um, overall we saw germination was highest for the two month and one month treatments. So we had 11% in both of those and then it tapered off for the two week in controls. Uh, so we did see some evidence that longer periods of stratification were useful for Onothera. Um, and then if we look at time series data, however, this is very interesting, at least to me, um, you see that uh, in the first two to three weeks, you have um, increased rates of germination. And then as it like time goes on, it eventually like, like, like plateaus and there's no more uh, germination around weeks three to four. And then it starts to pick back up. But due to time, I wasn't able to really look at this longer to see if there was some type of cycle that was occurring. Um, that would be something I would like to explore if I had um, more expansive time range. And then if we look at kind of all of this data together, uh, we can see another interesting point to where um, even though the two month and one month treatments had the same overall 11% germination results, we see that they started at varying times, but they did eventually meet and catch up. And we also see kind of just either a plateau or almost uh, like linear like increase of the two weeks and control models. And um, if I had more time as well, I would have liked to see if these two weeks in control groups also met with the two month and one month groups. And so the significance of my research overall, uh, mainly for restoration efforts. So prior to this, there was no um, data on the germination requirements of these two species. Um, and so for restoration efforts, uh, individuals need to know the appropriate time to sow seeds based on um, periods of last frost, um, as well as implications around climate change. Um, so as we remember in like February, we had like a week of really warm temperatures followed by our usual February temperatures. So if we take that and kind of like look back at that time series data to where germination was greatest within that one week period, um, if we had another like instance like that, you could have the seeds germinate in that one week and then another like cold spell then just kill them all off and you'll have really um, low, low rates in the population. Um, and then also there are horticultural uses, which I am also, my uh, minor is horticulture, so it's kind of fun to me. Um, so both uh, species within the same genus, so there are other hypericums and other onotheras are used commonly in horticulture. And if we look at onothera specifically, um, onothera, I think believe it's onothera biennis, is used very commonly as a primrose in horticulture, but it is a biennial species, so it completes its life cycle in two years and then dies out. But um, onothera fruticosa, however, is a perennial, so it comes back every year. It also has an evergreen um, basil rosette, so it kind of leaves like an evergreen ground cover almost. So this would add just another horticultural use for native plants. Um, which is really important for places like the botanical garden as they have like their native plant cells and for um, just kind of like bolstering like the amount of natives that are used in our landscape and just kind of give people more accessible options in their gardens. Um, and then limitations with my study. So um, I wasn't able to look to see if there was other treatments of hypericum hypericordes that may have been useful. Um, so other things like I could have potentially looked at because they do occur in fire maintained systems. Um, we could have looked to see if treatments of carotenolide, which is a uh, growth regulator that is produced from the burning of plant material that can uh, induce germination in specific species. So that may have been something that could have caused hypericum to germinate. Um, there was also, I don't have it listed, but there was also in the potential for, since it was a generalist, it could have not responded well to um, kind of the like higher light treatment that I was like giving for Onothera since that was kind of like the limiting factor species. Uh, so it might just not have liked the 
light regime they gave it. Um, I also had a limited time frame, one to conduct stratification, um, and also limited time in the growth chamber to see if I had any like cycles within my data or to see if hypericum just took a bit longer to germinate. Um, interesting in the literature as well, I found that seed shape can also influence time to germination. So uh, angular seeds, so if you remember I mentioned um, that Onothera had angular seeds, those have been recorded to germinate quicker in hypericum, which is kind of those like oval, oval shaped seeds, very smooth. Uh, smooth seeds also take um, longer time to germinate. So it goes into my limited <laughs> time frame impact. Um, and then it also could have been, so I talked about how my research was kind of centered around whether this was like just natural viability, but like human error could have also like influenced the viability of some of these seeds. So things like collection, storage, transport. Um, there's also been data in literature about how certain seeds respond well to increased time in storage. So that could have been another factor that influenced my results. So if I had more time, I would have loved to explore some of these alternatives. Um, but I would like to acknowledge um, a few people I like to involve, uh, acknowledge Erin Eichenberger, my mentor. She helped me with so much. She collected my um, hypericum seeds for me because I was unable to make it out into the field for that. The Irwin lab let me use a lot of the materials and I spent a lot of time there. The chef lab uh, rented a space for the Phytotron allowed me to use part of their space. And the um, Phytotron as well worked with me to get uh, light readings and chamber adjustments. Um, and then uh, the North Carolina Botanical Garden, um, they donated the Onothera seeds to me as well. So everyone was very helpful. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We did not, um, because uh, for one, usually soaking things seeds specifically in bleach solution acts as a form of scarification, so that would be a different kind of a treatment that I wasn't looking at as well as there is um, in some literature, there is uh, evidence that applying like fungicides and stuff can actually do more harm than good for the seeds. I, I had the same question, but it all um, it didn't seem to affect them too much because I did also see seeds pushing their little like radicals and their like cotyledons through the fungus. So I was like, you go, <laughs> you could do it. <laughs> um, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, hypericum, hypericoides, um, that was collected in the fall, I believe, of 2021. So I started this all in like winter of 2021. Um, and they were collected from Picture Creek and they were just left in dry storage um, out of like direct sun. Uh, and then Onothera, however, was collected from the botanical gardens, I guess, like from their populations on site. Um, and it was from 2020, so it was about a year old, so they did receive a bit longer. I don't know how they stored them. Um, I'm actually going to be working there in the, the upcoming summer, so maybe I can find out how they stored them <laughs> and, like, conclude my data then. But, uh, yeah, they were relatively recent, so. Any other questions? Satisfying. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. This concludes our Spring 2023 uh, Applied Ecology Miners Research Symposium. Um, again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the miner, how it works, if you want to mentor or be mentored. Um, thanks, y'all. Take good care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us online, Aaron and Jim.